It's me, Bussy, and welcome back to Hot or Rot. And today, we'll be reviewing the premiere of RuPaul's Drag Race Season 13. 13 queens entered the workroom, but only six made it out alive. Sounds like my bedroom on a Friday night. <laughs> First into the workroom, pump up the jam. It's Candy Muse. And she and Drag Race are very much pushing and trying to sell the I'm from the former house of Aja storyline and I guess create a little bit of drama between Aja, a past contestant, and Candy Muse, who is on the season now. Concerning the look, it's very 90s kid on the block carrying their stereo through the streets meets RuPaul's Drag Race Denim and Diamonds runway. I think this is cute. It very much does say Candy Muse. Literally, she has candy on one hip, Muse on the other. She has little K patch details on the actual denim accessorized radio box that she's carrying and another K on the chest. Y'all know gays love K. And I think overall it's quite effective at telling us exactly who Candy Muse is. She's loud in your face. She <laughs> is literally carrying a radio to broadcast her voice. And by the way, she is from New York. Don't forget it. As for having Candy in the competition, we're going to have to get mused to it. This look is hot. Are you ready for the next queen? It's Joey J. Joey's entrance line is Filler queen. I'm like, girl, wh why? Why are you saying that? It's very Detox's verse <laughs> in Ready Wrote You saying, I'm not the best, but I'm not the worst. I just don't understand why you would walk in and say that. Also, every time I see Joey now, I'm going to be wondering why she's wearing a wig. In her Meet the Queens, as you remember, she spent like 10 minutes telling us that she never wears wigs. So, uh, you know, I don't know what's going on with that. As far as the actual look, it's pretty. Like, I don't think there's really anything wrong with it. It's well made. It fits her body. It tells us a little story. She's got these giant little chicken ruffles on her arms. Like, there's just really nothing technically wrong with it. But there's also nothing exciting about it. Like, this doesn't tell me more about Joey J or anything unique about their drag. Like, any person, well, not any person, any drag queen could wear this look and pull it off effectively. This chicken needs to head back to the coop and lay another egg. It's a bagrat. <laughs> As for the lip sync between Joey and Candy, eh, maybe one of the least memorable lip syncs of the night. Fun nonetheless. Call Me Maybe is kind of, I think, a hard song to really like pack a punch to on Drag Race unless you're just selling tons and tons of comedy. Candy, I think, did that really well. She was making me laugh, although I think Joey was actually a better dancer and gave a better performance. So while I personally probably would have given the win to Joey, that's what happened on the show. Next up, the Frozen one, Denali. She skates in. Literally. She's the first queen to wear ice skates into the workroom. That was a bold, bold choice, but she pulled it off really, really well. I mean, I for her to spend an entire who knows how many hours in the workroom in ice skates and then do the lip sync in those, mama. Props to you. Props to you. That was a gag. As for her look, it's very Frozen Princess at the Disney ice skating show. It's cute. I think more importantly, it's perfectly on brand for Denali. A fun detail here that you almost miss if you aren't looking closely is that her skates are completely rhinestoned. Very cute little detail there. Her braided pony is giving me Frozen, but this look is not one I want to let go. <laughs> this look is... And if you're a seasoned Drag Race fan, like myself, you may be putting two and two together at this point and realizing that the entrance looks so far and the ones we will get to in just a second are all very performable, very danceable. If you're into conspiracy theories, you may be into this one. I think these queens were told in advance that they were going to be lip syncing, or at least performing. And girl, I think judging based on their acting, uh, if we can call it that. Well, let's just say nobody's going to be winning any Academy Awards. Next up, do re mi fa so. La la re. Oh, this look, this luck. Let's focus on the positive. Lala Ri, I think, is my favorite personality of the bunch after seeing her talk in the confessional and with the other queens. Ball of energy, ball of fun. I'm loving everything coming out of that mouth. Her look is very like CEO of the anti-vax Karen army meets Lana Del Rey wearing a mask at the beginning of the pandemic. <laughs> but she forgot her pants. This is so weird. It's so weird. I'm sorry, but what the hell is going on here? Like, how does this look represent Lala as a drag character? And then why is it only half of an outfit? I think you can do really simple things and have extremely effective looks. You'll see later when we get to Simone's that that is very possible to do, but here it just doesn't make any sense. The blazer doesn't even fit her that well. And then she's got the really flat wig on. I mean, let's at least put a little bit of a base tease or a pony. Let's put a pony in there. I don't know, something. This look is a rah, rah, rot. Denali and Lala re-lip sync to the Pussycat Dolls and some highlights. Denali did a cartwheel and ice skates. That was impressive. But her dress kept falling off and exposing her boy nipples. And we all know that's sort of like a taboo in the show. Like if your outfit is coming apart, you can't keep it on. Usually that does not bode well for you. We also see Lala Ri's big personality that I mentioned earlier transfer well into her lip syncing capabilities. She's an excellent dancer, knew the song, sold it to me. Her win made sense with my fantasy. And before we go any further, I want to quickly remind you to click that like button if you like what
what you're seeing and to press subscribe if you love drag and to join my Patreon if you want to help support this channel. In return for just a couple dollars a month, you can get things like your name and credits, personal shout outs, early access to my videos, exclusive content, and access to the Bussy Queen community discord. <gasps> and you get the satisfaction of knowing that you helped me eat this month. Thanks. Now let's get back to it. Next up, shake it. Shake it like a Polaroid picture, it's Simone. Simone reveals to us that Simone is the manifestation of a desire to save her life and express herself. A beautiful message which ties into her entrance look, which is a cocktail dress constructed of Polaroids of herself. This is all about self-love, self-expression, and I love it. It's simple, but also extremely effective. It's somehow high fashion and also high drag, but very streetwear and fun. I mean, this look is iconic. Walking into the workroom of RuPaul's Drag Race with nothing but photos of yourself covering your body. Gag. They say pictures say a thousand words, but sometimes just four are enough. Charisma, uniqueness, nerve, and talent. She has it all. Take a picture, or a few, and make a dress out of them. It'll last longer. This look is hot. <laughs> Holler at me, I know you know me. 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 <sighs> <laughs> that is Tamisha Iman's business tagline. We find out that she actually was cast on season 12, but found out she had cancer the weekend that she got the call and had to pass and defer to season 13. I'm happy she is much better and here on the show. God bless you. Tamisha has an extremely wholesome presence that lights up the room, and I really have a good, good feeling about her so far. As for her look, I would say that it's on brand for the business that she says she does. It's a well-tailored, highly structured red blazer with some red pants. There's some rhinestones detailing going up those intense shoulder pads. I really love the silhouette that the blazer creates, but it's kind of boring from the waist down. Like I want some more of those rhinestone sequin moments, maybe going down the sides of the leg as well. I don't know, just to zhuzh that up a little bit. And then I also really would love to have seen a wig with a little more volume. It's a little flat. I think if she fixed the pants and the hair, it could be a hot. For now, I'm going to leave this at a warming up. Simone and Tamisha lip syncs to The Pleasure Principle by Janet Jackson. And I would say it was quite pleasurable to watch. Tamisha is Amazing, she is an amazing dancer. She was Janet Jackson on that stage, all the moves hitting every single beat. However, Simone was selling much more comedy and making Rue laugh. Again, if you're making Rue laugh, you're going to win no matter what it is. And you know, maybe it's a shame sometimes that comedy wins over like raw performance talent, but that's what happens on RuPaul's Drag Race. That's the game they're playing. They know what they signed up for. Next up, she's smashing the Cisriarchy. <laughs> it's got me. Gomic reveals that she is a celebrity makeup artist, having even painted people like Paris Hilton. That's hot. Oh. I'm really loving everything about Gottmik, except for this look. <sighs> Y'all may hate me for this one. I don't know. I really loved Gottmik's promo and reveal look, but this one just doesn't really fit in with the Gottmik fantasy for me. There's something about it that's like missing the edge, missing the spikes. It's kind of just like Kiss Rock and Roll bobblehead plopped on top of a gymnast body. I, I don't know. The dress by itself, hot. Gottmik's extremely unique makeup, hair, and style in general. These two things mixed together? I'm not really buying it in this particular situation. The juxtaposition of these two ideas is a little bit too harsh for me personally. I think if there had been a little bit more cohesion in the actual dress that she's wearing, like maybe put a little black stripe through it, or maybe if it was all black and white with just a pop of color, I think for me it would have been a total hot. Like there's nothing wrong at all with the makeup or the actual dress. Just together, not my favorite. So I'm gonna leave it at a warming up. Next up, Strawberry Shortcake is all grown up. It's Utica. She says she's serving hot dishes of ridiculousness. Say that five times fast. <laughs> this look is as quirky and crazy as we know Utica to be. Is it my favorite look from Utica so far? No, but I like it a lot. Look is crazy and campy and fun and exactly what we would expect from her. But the problem is like, I've, we've already seen her amazing promo and amazing reveal looks. And I'm just kind of comparing the fabulosity of those to this one. There's so many different patterns and jewels and cuts of fabric to look at. And then she's got a giant strawberry on top of her head. I just want a little more of a through line between all the pieces. You know, it seems kind of like somebody pressed randomize on a sim and this is what they ended up with. Even though I was left a little confused overall when I saw this, it, it tells me exactly who she is and I know exactly whose look this is. Like if I just saw the pieces, I would say, oh, that's, that's Utica's outfit for sure. I'm gonna give this look a hat. 
And although these two looks weren't personally my favorite of the bunch of queens, I think mostly because they had such amazing promo and reveal looks that really overshadow these entrances, they actually are two of my favorite queens in the competition and some of my picks for top four. They got to lip sync to Rumors by Lindsay Lohan, which I almost lost my shit to. I'm a very big Lohan stan, by the way, if you didn't know. I'm actually wearing a wig that was restyled from one of the very first times that I was in drag where I was dressing as Katie Heron from Mean Girls. So hearing Rumors on Drag Race was kind of like crack for me. Say crack again. In the actual lip sync, Got Mix sells the song a bit better. Her performance makes more sense with the vibe. I will say this is kind of maybe a harder song to actually lip sync to. And then Utica was kind of just flailing all over the stage being crazy and kooky. And it was funny, but maybe not necessarily fitting the message of the song. So Got Mix takes that win and that makes sense to me. Next up, Think Pink, it's Rosé. Rosé says that she's the comedy queen, the metaphorical child of Robin Williams and Jim Carrey. Uh, girl, those are some big shoes to fill because I didn't see her crack not one joke. But that's not to say she isn't talented. In fact, she lets us know that she has been on The Voice and America's Got Talent. She was also part of a girl group with Jan in New York. Girl, told you they love a reference point. They love connecting queens to other queens. But Rosé's giving me very like opposite vibes of Jan. If Jan is like America's sweetheart, then Rosé is the foiled villain in that story, plotting the overthrow of that sweet little girl. Anyways, her look is entirely made of pink satin and it's giving me an 80s grease Lady Birds fantasy. It absolutely screams rosé. She's even carrying a little wine glass accessory with her that's been completely rhinestoned to pour her rosé into, of course. And I'm not really sure what she was planning with the missing tooth bit when she walked into the workroom, but it didn't get to happen because she was, to her, the only person in there, so she wiped it off. I don't know. But I'll raise my glass to this look. It's hot. Next up, pull back the curtain and make a dress out of it. It's Olivia Lux. She is our baby queen of the season, having been doing drag for about a year and a half at this point. And we also see this little storyline for me where Olivia was apparently competing in a competition that Rose was hosting. So it's like a big moment for Rose to realize like, oh shit, like I was the host of this thing and now she's there competing with me. And then of course, as we will see, Olivia wins the lip sync, which is upsetting to Rose. Olivia is a pure ball of sunshine. I mean, every time she smiles, I smile. It, just an amazing presence on TV. I love this person immediately. As for her look, it's a split yellow and pink velour gown with lots of beautiful rouging up and down and some rhinestone detailing that really makes it pop. I also love her sexy little exposed shoulders with those opera gloves conservatively covering the rest of her look. And she too has a tiny accessory, a little tiny pink bag. This thespian really broke a leg. This look is hot. Rosé and Olivia lip sync to X's and O's by El King, in which Olivia is, is absolutely killing it. She has a moment where she's playing air guitar. Everything about what she's doing is perfectly mixed between little choreographed moments that you can tell are regularly part of her routine with comedy. She is selling both of those perfectly. She is so comfortable on that stage. Rosé, on the other hand, was extremely intense. Like every time I looked at her on the screen, I was uncomfortable, like that intense. Like she wanted to win that lip sync so badly that she just read as almost desperate at it. Like she did great, but it was scary to watch. Olivia deservedly wins that lip sync. Next up, she cracked the code. The fire code. <laughs> it's Tina Burner. She says she's the premier costume comedy queen in New York and has been doing drag for 10 years. And look. I wasn't sure how I was feeling about Tina Burner until she referenced showgirls in her confessional. We have no choice but to stand. Her look is extremely on brand. She's wearing her signature color palette, red, orange, yellow. I'm wondering how long it's gonna take Michelle to ask her to wear something different. I think it's very easy to underappreciate this look because so many of the details are effortlessly part of the outfit, but are actually amazingly campy comedy pieces. For example, the fire hose is a belt, the TB on the badge, which is a purse. Her wig is literally a fire woman's hat. Like this is brilliantly done from head to toe. It tells me who she is. It uses her signature colors and is also funny and unique and uh, it's drag. It's drag. And that's what I love the most. This look is on fire. It's hot. Next up, life in plastic. It's fantastic. It's Ka Mora Hall. She says she's living the rich white woman fantasy and is Jane's drag sister. She has this little moment in the workroom when she asks Tina Burner, oh, who are you wearing? To which Tina Burner doesn't really understand the question, I think because Kamora was definitely trying to set up a moment for her to brag about her Bob Mackie dress, which she got the moment for later on the runway with Carson Kressley. Have, don't worry. She loves to represent that rich, plastic, perfect fantasy. And this absolutely does that in a unique flavor, the 60s glam one. It's gorgeous, she's perfect, but is Kimura going to struggle to be more than just a Barbie doll in this competition? Will she be able to show us in the upcoming episodes who she really is? I'll be waiting to find out, but until then, we know Barbie loves to have fun in the sun, and the sun is hot. 
just like her look. Next, T, up, it's Elliot. T, I'm not saying it. Leave that in there, because I'm not saying Elliot with two Ds. She says she's the most famous drag queen you've never heard of. And she's a housewife with a secret. I mean, yeah, the look is exactly what she said it is, housewife. If that's her drag, housewife, she executed it perfectly. The outfit is really quite cute. I love the little 80s shoulder pad moment that she has going on. It's a cute pattern. The bralette and pants fit super well. The little chain necklace is a little campy detail. I maybe would have liked to have seen, I don't know, some kind of like fascinator in the hair, something to maybe just like drag it up and add a little more element of camp to it and really, really sell that fantasy more so than just actually looking like a pedestrian housewife. That said, it's a very cute look and I think that this is a real hot look. <laughs> These three all lip synced to Lady Marmalade. This maybe was my favorite lip sync of the entire night. Tina Burner absolutely killed that little Kim verse. And I don't know if you noticed, but Tina Burner got away with miming <gasps> cock sucking and fisting <gasps> in that song and some other sexually deviant things, things I would never do. But yeah, not only did she have an amazing stage present, knew every word, absolutely sold the song, but also made us laugh. It was an absolutely deserved win on her part. Kamora Hall, I think, struggled to find her footing in the lip sync until the very end when she had that little back bend to the death drop moment. And Elliot was an amazing dancer, I have to say. I was very impressed by Elliot. I think maybe just lacking a little bit of comedy because we always need that comedy element on RuPaul's Drag Race, don't you ever forget it. <laughs> and my show really is about the contestants of RuPaul's Drag Race, but I simply can't let Ru's look go untalked about. <laughs> Wow. The contacts? Sickening. I wonder like what Raven had to do to convince Rue to wear her contacts. Rue looked flawless. Absolutely stunning. The hair, the dress. She was the labia minora and majora in that thing. Stunning. Obviously, I think this look is hot. As for my hottest hot, well, they say a picture says a thousand words, and tonight, her said a million. My hottest hot is Simone. I also ask my patrons every single week to vote for their hottest hot over on patreon.com slash bussyqueen. It's one of their member benefits. And this week, they've chosen Gotmic. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next week. Love you. Bye. Bye, ugly. It's me, Bussy, and welcome back to Hot or Rat. And today we'll be reviewing the runways from RuPaul's Drag Race Season 13, Episode 2. In the fashion show mini challenge, each of the queens from the winning group, joined by Elliot with two T's, had to present a ladylike daytime look and a nighttime vampy look that says, I'm a <gasps> And on the rain stage, the runway category was LeMay, You Stay. The queens were also challenged to write lyrics, choreograph, and perform in a remix to RuPaul's Congratulations. Girl, I'm tired and I'm just talking about what they did. Who said being a bedroom queen was easy? <laughs> Before we get started, I want to remind you to click that like button if you want to save Porkchop from her shift to the Golden Corral and hit subscribe if the bus is still running. Now, let's get into the looks. First up, she's got two T's in her name, and it's not Elliot's, it's Gottmik. Immediately, Gottmik proves daytime drag doesn't always have to be scary. This is the first time we've seen her out of her signature white face. She's got a shtick, but turns out there's a brush attached to it. Oh, and a palette that's shaped like the sun. This is high campy drag. Silhouette is amazing. Shoulders up to the ceiling and legs long long, 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 going down to the floor. I'm really loving that big red bush of hair. Does the carpet match the drapes? A perfect pairing to this sunshine rainbow, blue sky, latex dress. She's the only one to push this category to the literal interpretation of the word daytime. She's got two suns on her outfit and she's not even showing. <laughs> They say Icarus flew too close to the sun, but Gottmik must have been right there with them. This look is hot. As for her nighttime look, tell me it's a nightmare and move over Elvira, there's a new spooky seductress in town. Somehow she managed to get into this look and make her face wider, more like her traditional face. Not quite as wide as it typically is, but she made that switch nonetheless for this look. I think this look is an excellent contrast to her daytime look because doing both of these in the same fashion show shows how versatile Gottmik is, both with her makeup artistry and vision of her outfits. Like, get you one that can do both, you know what I mean? I love the nipple cover with the pearls matching the pearl necklace. Who doesn't love a pearl necklace? This is kind of like Vampyra meets a 50s pinup doll from the future. Gottmik made a lot of choices this episode. A lot of right choices. This look is hot. As for her LeMay runway, well, that Golden Girls reboot sure is looking good. I love that we see her in this like signature headpiece moment, very similar to the one that we saw on her promo look. It's entirely gold catsuit LeMay Thing with a cape, it's absolutely gorgeous. We're also seeing her signature ruffles, signature makeup. This is really truly Gottmik's artistry all put together into one. She's got this like Alexander McQueen meets Gamay of Thrones <laughs> from outer space. This look is absolutely hot. 
I'm also loving that we're starting to see a lot of Gottmik's main looks, right? Her promo reveal and this first runway really come together and showcase this unique vision of what Gottmik's drag is and what it's going to be. However, giving the future of drag doesn't necessarily always mean you know what's coming next. Her choreography and performance overall in the remix of Congratulation, uh, not great. She did admit that she was really struggling on the day that they were trying to learn the choreography because she hadn't yet talked about her trans identity with the rest of the cast. Her performance in this was a rat. Next up, our talking head of the season, Candy Muse. Her daytime look for the fashion show was really confusing. Period. Give me like 18th century order in the court judge meets queen of hearts meets old maid, you know, from like the card game. It really is just a mess from top to bottom. I think she was trying to do way too many different things for this and really trying to push herself out of the box, but unfortunately slipped and fell on her way out. It almost looks like she woke up on the wrong side of the bed, then like fell on top of the curtains, kept rolling, turned that into a dress, fell out the window, messed up the hair, stopped at the Fierce Drag Jewel store on the way to the runway, and then finally got there. I also just don't see how this fits ladylike daytime drag. For this look, she should be committed. It's a rat. But at least that jury is hung. <laughs> Allegedly. As for her nighttime look, they say she did it for the glory. Oh. <laughs> it appears she was going for some sort of androgynous devil thing here. The vision, I think, was a really cool way to approach this runway. Again, Candy trying to step out of that box, I think more successfully than her daytime look, for sure. But there were just a couple missteps here that didn't make a lot of sense. For example, if you're going for this devil thing, and like, why put tiny little horns on the shoulders like that? And then the braided swirl things, I think were a cool idea, but I wanted more of them. Michelle asked her if the hole in the back was supposed to hold a tail. She said yes, but I have a feeling the real answer was no. Look at that lipstick, okay? <laughs> that doesn't tell the whole story. I don't know what does. Candy was on a highway to hell, but I think got a little bit distracted at one of the truck stops. This look is a pot. As for her LeMay runway, she was giving us 2000s Paris Hilton socialite meets like 70s go-go girl of the future. Overall, I think a really cute look. More on brand for Candy than either of her fashion show looks from what I know about her and her drag, for sure. I like that the 90 revealed to that little like chevron printed silver LeMay panty and matching bra top. A cute little way to do it. This look was really cohesive with a clear vision and I'm glad she got some rest. Or maybe she didn't sleep a wink. Regardless, this look is hot. Candy in the challenge and the judges judging her in that challenge was a little bit weird for me. I really enjoyed her lyrics and performance overall, yet the judges seemed to be really fixated on some moment, which I didn't even notice where she apparently messed up choreography. But for her lyrics alone, I'm gonna give her performance in the main challenge a hot. Next up, what's the tea? It's La La Ri. For her daytime look, the sun is shining, the birds are chirping, and Miss La La Ri's makeup, smile, and hair are singing. She says she's giving us a little bit of Southern Belle, maybe with her personality, but I didn't really see that in the look. Where's the petticoat, maybe a hat, something to really push it to the next level. My mind goes to like Disney princess type of looks when I think of something like that. It just looks a little bit like something you could purchase ready to wear and less like fashion show runway, which was what they were supposed to give us in this challenge. Lala looks gorgeous, but was it fashion? Not to me. This look was a rat. As for her nighttime look, pleather? I hardly know her. Lala is giving us I'm a <gasps> with this look, <laughs> just like RuPaul asked her to do. On anyone else, this look probably wouldn't have worked, but Lala can sell a fantasy and that's going to take her very far in this competition. My favorite parts of this are those like loose fishnet sleeves and top under the tight bodice with that peplum around the waist. I think she has just enough pep lem in her step. <laughs> Y'all know this girl, okay? She is like the life of the party. She turns it up at the club. She is there spending every last dollar out of her checking account to buy everybody in their shot so that everyone has a good time. And then she steals her man after. It's good to know this Southern Belle can throw it down when she needs to. This look is hot. On the main runway. Oh, Ferrero no she but a don't. <laughs> This was excellence. Excellent, gorgeous, beautiful, loved it. She looks expensive, rich. She is drag royalty in this look. And then after seeing this look and how big and opulent it was, I kind of appreciated some of her like more pedestrian looks that she did do in that fashion show. Cause I was like, oh, it's really cool that she can tone it down or totally elevate it whenever she needs to for whatever occasion she needs to. Her look is as golden as her personality. She found the ticket. No wait, she is the ticket. This look is hot. 
As for Lala in the main challenge, I think her lyrics were funny, the choreography was great, she had a really solid performance, and it was definitely deserving of a hot. However, I think she kind of got lost in the mix there. She's gonna need to do something maybe to stand out a little bit more when she's competing against some of these super loud personalities and people that are turning insane looks on the runway. Next up, it is a known fact that women do carry a bag in the morning, afternoon, evening, when she's in the shower, when she goes to sleep, if that woman is Olivia Lux. For her daytime look, the 60s call, she's giving us mod earn woman. It kind of reminds me of Shay's dress that we recently saw on her All-Stars run, the blue camo thing. I really, really love what Olivia did here. It just goes to show that different people's drag characters can do something similar to somebody else, but just do it in such a unique and beautiful way. Also, these dresses are kind of hard to get right. I think they can sometimes end up looking just a little bit potato sacky, but Olivia pulls it off with ease. I guess you could say Olivia's great in the sack. <laughs> Camera, lights, fashion. This look is hot. As for her nighttime look, Rue told her, give me I'm a <gasps> She said, okay, how about a pompadour? Y'all, look at the beauty, the effortless beauty. That dress is gorgeous. The glitter, the textures, the slit. Look at that slit. It's a tight little slit. <laughs> oh, and the color of that dress against her melanin skin is almost orgasmic. She's accepting her Oscar and stealing her man at the same time. This look is hot. As for her lame runway, well, she looks fame us in this look. She's giving you some old Hollywood glamour in these like soft silvery and muted green colors. Just again, effortless beauty. And I have to call out her hair here. She does hair so beautifully. Like every single time, meticulous curls or like placements of baby hairs or something that just, mm, Gorge. She just reads as so put together, fashion forward, carefully crafted, and unique. This is a green look even Michelle can't refuse. A lame by any other name would smell as sweet. This look is hot. As for her performance, she was named as one of the top two of her group. I think she had an excellent performance. I couldn't take my eyes off of her. However, the lyrics were a little unmemorable for me. Her performance was hot. Next up, I can't get enough of her. Let's have some more of Simone. Y'all, before we get started on this queen, no one else is doing it like her in drag, period. Now that we've established that, let's move into her daytime look. She's giving me 90s business <gasps> She invented investing. She owns everything. But she still works the pole at night because she enjoys the workout. <laughs> the color combination of this outfit is so bizarre. It's almost ugly and in a satin fabric, no less, but so beautiful the way that she executed it. Like there is no one else that could do something so wrong and make it look so right. Her hair is like 90s player club hair is a movie that she references in her confessional while talking about this look. Skirt, cape, jacket, mug. The second this look hit the runway, she escaped with my heart. Get it? Because she had a cape on her look. This look is hot. And when the lights go down and the vampy <gasps> come out, Simone shows us that she's a freak in the streets and in the sheets. And we know because she's still wearing the sheet from her bed and the underground cave that she lives in. <laughs> This is cyberpunk 90s matrix fashion meets Grecian Aphrodite goddess with some braided Medusa-like hair that is literally show-stopping. I love the pattern of the material she used to create the main part of the dress looks almost like fleshy. And then the top part underneath that looks even fleshier. Like it just looks so abstract and avant-garde and truly fashion show. This is what we want from a mini challenge that is meant to showcase fashion. Give me the red pill, because I'm ready to party with Simone. This look is hot. As for her LeMay runway, is it Boxing Day already? She's in a dragged up boxer's uniform representing her drag house, House of Avalon, and herself, Simone, the Ebony Enchantress. The details on this? Mama, the details on this. She's got some gold LeMay trim on the cape of her boxing uniform, as well as it looks like the material of the gloves have some gold interwoven LeMay in them. It's really, really pretty and stunning. Also that double pigtail braid. <gasps> Million dollar baby? No, 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 no. Trillion dollar baby. I love that we're seeing Simone can do very high fashion looks like we saw in her mini challenge, but also more campy, costumey kind of looks that are also fashionable that we saw in the main runway tonight. She is so versatile. Oh, and no one has a better runway walk than Simone either. Okay, watch it back. Play the tapes. LeMay looks great on Simone, and I'm hooked. This look is <laughs> In the main challenge, she gave a great performance and had memorable lyrics. Hit the beat, I mean bopping, topping, she was killing it, absolutely. Her performance was <laughs> And let's just have a moment of silence for her slayage this week. <sighs> Next up, she's known to keep you up late, but 
at least she's a good time, it's Tina. As for her daytime fashion look, she says she's giving us a Carrie Bradshaw Dior moment, which wasn't what my mind initially went to, but I pulled up some references and I was like, oh, okay. Like I can see that as a point of inspiration, but wasn't necessarily fashionable in the way that those looks were. Like she wasn't really pushing any boundaries with her look like Carrie did in the show. And I guess that's what I'm really looking for in a fashion runway. What are you doing that's different from what the other queens are doing? I saw this and I thought, oh, it's beautifully executed, meticulously crafted. There's lots of great details, sparkle, bows, ruffles. It's gorgeous, the tulle skirt, but is it fashion? It's Tina's take on a classic campy drag look. And by Tina's take, I mean, she took a classic look and made it red. But I do think this look is hot. As for her nighttime look, I didn't know Ronald McDonald was taking night shifts at the strip club. <laughs> By the time I saw this look, I was a little bit tired of all the red, orange, and yellow that we have consistently been seeing from her. Like, I love when a queen has a consistent brand that they apply to challenges and looks and stuff like that but it can also feel a little overwhelming if it's all we see from them. I think my other issue with this is that it does read, I'm a <gasps> but it doesn't necessarily read nighttime. I think it's really difficult to read nighttime when your look is brighter than the sun itself. <laughs> and concerning the pieces of the outfit, the harness is really distracting for me. I don't think it fits well with the entire picture of what she's wearing. And I just feel like this is something I've seen a million times. Like, does she look good? Yes. I just would love to have seen her push the boundary and then fit the category a little bit better. Latex is a hot material, but this look is a rot. As for her LeMay runway, it is a known fact that a woman do carry an ax. She's giving us like a little bit Tin Man, a little bit soccer mom from the 20s. <laughs> the look again isn't my favorite stylistically. Like the type of clothes that Tina chooses to put on her body are things that I particularly love myself, but I can definitely respect them for what they are and appreciate her personal fashion choices. You also have to appreciate the level of detail and artistry that went into making this look. I mean, she has like that red heart that she opens her biker jacket to and the Axe purse, very, very smart things. Like when you're looking, you're like, oh, that's really cool. Oh, that's really cool. You know, I love looks that you keep finding things as you look at them. This look was not a perfect 10 for me, but it is a 10 nonetheless. <laughs> this look is hot. In the main challenge, she proves that while her looks may not be something that people are going to be fangirling over, I think people can definitely appreciate and look forward to her every time she hits a stage. Her lyrics, the dancing, the choreo, I mean, she did so well. The rapping, she really burned up the stage. Her performance was hot. And finally, it's Elliot with two T's and three eliminations. <laughs> For her daytime look, she's giving us modern Parisian woman with some 80s ruffles on the shoulders. Okay, the vision is cute. Is it like super daytime reading? Uh, maybe? The silhouette is great, the idea is cute. I really love the ruffles and the asymmetrical skirt, but, and this is a big one. Okay, that corset is bad. It's really bad. I hate it. It looks like she took like a black corset from Amazon and then put it on top of a really expensive, carefully constructed gown. Like in the words of Kim Kardashian, why would you put a bumper sticker on a Bentley? Because of the corset, girl? <laughs> it's a rot. As for her nighttime look, now you see her. She's giving me the 80s saloon steampunk version of her daytime look. I like that she connected the threads here and she took off the corset and replaced it with a much better one, one that was actually designed to go with the look. I love that fountain of feathers coming off that top hat. My one critique is it's a little more costumey than fashionable. Like I think there might've been a way to take elements of this and put it into something super fashion forward, but instead she kind of relied more on classic campy drag aesthetic. But hey, she is serving regardless. She really dominated that runway. This look is hot. As for her LeMay look, this is the <laughs> dress that you buy when you're living in the 80s and the prom theme is Winter Wonderland. Uh, this is a style choice that I personally abhor. Like I really, really personally don't like it, but I have to give her props. It's well constructed, thought out. She looks gorgeous. I mean, there's absolutely nothing wrong here. She fit the category well, it was a unique approach, and I think it was well done. It's just not something that I would ever look at and be like, oh, I love it, I wanna wear it, you know? She's skating on thin ice, but I can't ignore that she looks beautiful. This look is hot. Like her looks or not, you also have to recognize that Elliot had some of the best dancing, actually the best dancing in the performance. That split! <gasps> she jumped about 10 feet into the air, boom, fell right on that <gasps> I mean, 
owie wowie, I was gaggity waggity, okay? Her lyrics, a little cliche. Overall, I'm gonna give her a hat. So no one is eliminated. It is our winner's group after all. I think they deserve their immunity. Simone and Olivia are our top two and they lip sync for the win. Y'all, this lip sync, oh, it was so good. Good, oh my God. You can tell when someone really wants something, both of them really, really wanted something. And that was to win that $5,000. The lip sync was excellent. They both did well. It was a tough call, but I kind of thought Olivia deserved the win. What do y'all think? Let me know down in the comments below. As for my hottest hot, I usually, only do one, okay? But this episode was so big, there were so many looks, and the fashion show was so amazing. I'm gonna give the hottest hot of the fashion show to Simone, she ate that up. And my hottest hot of the LeMay runway to Gottmik. I also ask my patrons to vote for their hottest hot every single week over on patreon.com slash buzzyqueen. It's one of their member benefits. And this week they voted for Gottmik. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. Love ya, bye. Hi, ugly. It's me, Bussy, and welcome back to or rot. And today we'll be reviewing episode three of RuPaul's Drag Race season 13. Wow, that's a lot of threes. The same number of syllables in my name and the same number of points on a triangle. <gasps> Bussy Queen Illuminati confirmed. Just kidding, but maybe not. <laughs> Today our queens from the Pork Chop crew competed in a Lady in the Vamp fashion show mini challenge, wrote lyrics and choreographed an original dance number to RuPaul's Phenomenon. And on the main stage, the runway category was We're Here, We're Sheer. I'll be breaking all that down for you today, but before we get started, I want to remind you to hit like if you're into threes and to press subscribe if you support gay rights. Now, let's get started. First up, she's breaking all the blues this week. It's Denali. For her lady look in the mini challenge, she's giving us this blue baby doll dress accessorized with a beautiful pile of yellow curls hair. It kind of reminds me of one of those treats that she would eat on like a hot day at the county fair. The dress is covered in forget-me-nots, which is an homage to her Alaskan roots. And there's tons of little like yellow dots all over it. Maybe she got caught in a golden snowstorm. <gasps> they ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really f Anyways, Alaskan fashion has never looked better. Forget-me-not? No, no, no. Forget me. <laughs> and as for her vampy look, the runway, the runway, the runway's on fire. Well, it was, and then Denali crawled out of the soot pile. This look, she says, is inspired by the fall 2016 Moschino runway, which I guess was like women emerging from a burnt ballroom. I'm loving it. The silhouette, the cage skirt, the hair, everything about it is so not Denali, but also so Denali. It's just like a darkness I didn't expect out of our little Disney ice princess. There might be a Disney villain in there. This is also something I love because it looks like it would fit well in a Tim Burton movie. He would put Helena Bottom Carter in this dress to go to the grocery store. Denali is so hot in this look, she's burnt to a crisp. <gasps> Denali in the challenge. Icy, spicy. <laughs> for you, I'm too pricey. Going for the gold, so I'm gonna get a little feisty. I think we just found Cardi B's ghostwriter. Plus the dancing was just everything. Like she literally did everything. She went for the gold and also got the silver and the bronze. It was a sweep. This was hot. As for her sheer runway, she's giving me like Ariana Grande as a spicy little ice cream scoop. She's wearing lavender and black. That's it. Lavender Black, that's actually a great drag name. It's very like Dangerous Woman goes to her Sweet 16 or maybe the prom. I'm loving this very consistent vision of fashion and who she is as a drag character. Also again, the versatility of it all. She did so much with so little. It's so simple, but effective and beautiful. It's giving me soft and hard and hot. And I think anybody that was harboring any doubts about Denali can lay those to rest because girl, she's here to make it sheer. She is a fierce competitor. Next up, she just got back from the PT gay. <laughs> it's Joey J. Let's start off with what I love about every single one of Joey's looks, the confidence. Joey will sell you pedestrian mall fashion like it is the hottest designer on the block. Her first look in the fashion show, the lady look. <sighs> It's giving me lady, but like Jamie Lee Curtis lady who just went on a shopping spree at Buckle and is now hanging out in the ski lounge. The pom-poms on those boots, very confusing choice with the vest and the gold chains. All of it is very just, it's just not my personal taste. And it's just really not what I'm looking for from a fashion show. Unless that fashion show is for Forever 21. Anyways, it's a rock. And her vampy look. <laughs> this is that PTA mom having the midlife crisis now. 
girl. There are parts I like. The dragon scales sleeves are great. Joey, again, the level of confidence there, showing off this very dark lady look. It fits the category, but I just don't like the pieces. The previous look and this one, I think also are both missing a concept. And I think that really is what we are looking for in a fashion show runway. I mean, just look at what some of the other girls did. You know, they really, really sold a fantasy where this is just middle-aged mom trying to be cool and hip with the kids, you know? I will say, that smile and that ass dough, <laughs> that booty is banging. But someone turned off the lights and then Joey J got dressed. This look is a rat. The challenges episode was a bright spot, however, for Joey J. The dancing was phenomenal. <laughs> The lyrics were great. Overall, Joey really shined here, and I actually liked this look in particular. I think the vision for her personal fashion taste level here really climaxes, and I'm understanding it more as I see this, like, mummy blue camo fantasy. Anyways, in the challenge, J-O-E-Y-H-O. As for Joey's main runway, well, I'm not sheer about this. Ugh. This is for when you have the runway at five and Jazzercise at seven. It's very like Flapper 20s meets Vegas Drag Showgirls performance number. I think what really threw me off here was that plain black headband wrapped around the forehead. That would have made sense in the challenge, but on the runway, like, let's put one sequin on it to match the, the dress that you're wearing, right? I think you could have vibes with this a lot more if maybe let's say there was like a 20s inspired sequin headpiece with a ton of feathers on top of it. You know, amp it up a little bit. I don't care if she's got a wig on or not, but the point of what the judges were saying was with Angina having a bald head, it's more of an accessory to Angina than the main part of her look. Like she's not walking out on the stage and saying like, here's my bald head, eat it. Angina has her bald head and every single time you see her, she's got on a different accessory, some new fascinator. So I think that's what I personally would love to see come out of Joey's drag is the evolution of figuring out how to use that hair in the drag in a way that is elevated because when you're competing against other girls, especially ones like Kimura, you look over, she's got on 10 wigs. I mean, and you've got on nothing on the head except for a piece of black fabric wrapped around your forehead. It's just, it feels like there was less effort put in. Not to be flappant, but there's about 20 different things I would do differently here. For me, this look is going to be a rat. Next up. <laughs> Rose. Girl, okay, in the workroom, she was giving Coco a run for her money with how much orange base she puts under that paint. It was like, oh, girl, Willy Wonka done lost an Oompa Loompa. In the mini challenge, her lady look. Yes. It was a departure from that soft pink rose brand into something totally different for her that was really refreshing. She says she's giving us a Moschino inspired paper doll fantasy, but also this is very like um, Team Rocket from Pokemon cosplaying as Pikachu meets middle-aged woman uh, that works as an art curator. And instead of showcasing the art girl, tonight she's wearing it. And she really is stepping out of that big pink box. This look is hot. Couture. Her vampy look. The caged skirt sings. This was another great look from her. I did not expect her to slay these looks in the way that she did. Truthfully, I was ex kind of expecting like two more pink looks, but she blew me away. For a fashion show runway, this is the type of shit that I'm looking for. Inspire me, gobble me, swallow me, down a side of me. <laughs> It's also very like Raiden from Mortal Kombat meets Lady Gaga in American Horror Story Hotel. I'm loving the red crystals dripping from the shoes, matching the crystals on the bodice. Perfection from head to toe. She is the red melting candle in the castle and the candelabra and the ghost haunting it. Rosé, I'm drunk in love and this look is in the challenge. Another super strong performance. Every single one of these girls almost super killed it this week. She's another queen that has everything it takes to get to the finale because she wants it bad, bad. She wants it bad. Anyways, she slayed it and proved that she doesn't need to be a part of Stephanie's child to succeed. It was a hot performance. On the main runway. Well, girl, the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell and uh, Rosé is the endoplasmic reticulum of season 13. <laughs> I was really loving what she was doing this episode. <laughs> then I saw this. Um, mm, mm. She says it is an outfit constructed of hand dyed plastic. Surely this was recycled plastic. Part of me hates it, but then also part of me loves it because the silhouette is great. I love the way it moves. The arm ruffle things are really cool. And it was also a really interesting take on sheer. Nobody else used totally plastic materials to create their garment, I think. 
it is actually a very good look, but it's kind of like escargot, right? You, you don't want it all the time, but it's good when you have it. Rosé really bubbled to the top this week and I think this look is hot. Next up, in my notes this week for Tamisha Iman, I wrote consistently surprises. This channel is officially a Tamisha Iman stand channel. She's like our confessional queen, performance queen, pageant queen, starting with her lady look. Well, she pulled this right off the velvet hanger. Okay, she's giving us Joan Crawford meets bored rich housewife with too much money at the cocktail hour by the pool on a hot summer evening. I love that it's so casual, but also fashionable and expensive looking. Also, one of my favorite quotes, she said, it ain't drag if you ain't got no stones on. <laughs> Someone has to teach the children, and it is the mother of the cast. Tamisha, thank you. This look is hot. In her vamp look, she's wearing only the hair necessities. She's giving us an O'Hara fantasy. <laughs> It's always surprising, I think, when someone does like a hair constructed garment on a runway that did not demand or ask for hair in any way, because I think as a material, if you can call it that, to construct an outfit, almost impossible to use. No one expects 80 inches, but when they see it, well. It's like Queen of the Pageant World meets Queen of Darkness, and then also just made of hair, because why the hell not? If you have the talent to do it, do it. Hellfire and Hairstone. This look is hot. In Phenomenon, I loved the moments in the episode where she had to kind of step in and rein in all the children. She was like, who gave these children all, these, all this candy? Because they're like acting up. In the actual challenge, I do kind of agree with the judges. Her outfit was amazing. Another great garment. I'm assuming also constructed by her. But I think the lyrics and performance of her being on the stage was missing a little bit of punch. But I'm still going to give her overall performance in Phenomenon a hot. And finally on the runway. Okay, I can see Shirley now. The rain is gone. Look at her. I don't know who gave her the right, but she is doing absolutely nothing wrong. Another favorite quote from Tamisha this week, the spotlight hits me just right, as it does. <laughs> And the fact that she made this, like, makes it even more delectable. The hair, the makeup, she is stunning. She owns every inch of the runway. And that garment, it's a very opulent looking garment that belongs to somebody that commands a runway. And she is commanding the runway, okay? It, it is her, she owns it. She probably made that runway too, girl. If Kamora was like the princess of glamour on this runway, which we'll get to in a second, then Tamisha was the queen of glamour. This look is hot. Next up, on the seventh day, God created Utica. <laughs> Her lady look. Well, you know, it's 2021 and ladies have balls too. Okay, get used to it. Give me mad scientist uh, meets, as she says, McDonald's playpen meets crazy cat lady. I like the whimsicality, the kind of childlike inspiration of it all, but I think as a total look from head to toe, I think was just one step too far. I think I would have really appreciated this a little bit more if she had left all the balls in the hair and then maybe on the shoes and then completely off the dress because on the dress, I love the cut, the sheer cutout in the waist and the pattern of the dress. It's totally gorgeous. But then she kind of like haphazardly and randomly glued balls to this beautiful dress. It didn't look as cohesive, I think, as it could have. I think another option to complete the look, put even more balls on it, okay? We all love balls. Just keep adding them until you're just covered in balls. Balls from head to toe. Balls, balls, balls. Let's go balls to the wall. I think her magic carriage was taking her in the right direction to the ball, but maybe mm, got a flat tire on the way. I'm gonna leave this one at a warming as for her vampy look. Magic wand, make my drag queen grow. Like you can't tell me this is not Rita Repulsa, but like meets 18th century Victorian era queen of hearts kind of style. It's really cool. I love it. I also love that she has connected this look to her first look. Her balls now are kind of flat and decayed. They're all used up. There's nothing left in them. <laughs> Another thing to note here, she is doing things with her makeup that none of the other queens did. Everyone else just kind of did like basic face and she put on like dots and swirls and curls and twirls. The rest of the world may have moved on to streaming services, but she's still on satellite and because she's their only customer, well, she's got a crystal clear picture. This look is hot. In the main challenge, she had one of my favorite outfits. It was that very energetic child that I think lives with inside Utica. I think she very much has two very different visions coexisting within her, which we even see play out a little bit on her main runway. She has this sort of childlike, happy-go-lucky thing. And then she's also got this like evil spirit kind of coexisting with the darkness sort of wrapped around all of that happiness. Woo! 
Ooh, this look is hot. On the runway, well, again, she is doing things that no one else is doing. And I think we have to give her a lot of credit for that. There's a level of originality here that really stands out amongst everyone else who is kind of going for more classic types of glamour. This look overall is giving me kind of like Hungry, the makeup artist slash model slash visionary meets watercolor necromancer. This look, I think, perfectly showcases that dynamicism that lives within her. It's just very tortured soul and I'm a sucker for a tortured soul. <laughs> Utica, if you're listening, are you trying to tell us something? Are you okay, girl? As for making looks, ah, oh, she's got a real nix for it. She painted with all the colors of the wind, or at least some of them, and I think this look is <laughs> Finally, Kamora. She reminds us that perfection and beauty truly can't be rushed. The five to six hours to get ready thing, whoa. Kind of reminds me of me when I was first starting learning how to paint, and then it kind of made sense when she let us know that she only does drag like once a month, and I was like, okay, that kind of makes sense, because if you're not doing it on a weekly basis or multiple times per week basis, you're just not gonna have that speed, I think, that comes with the repetition of doing it over and over and over again. And by the way, I also want to say five to six hours isn't that crazy. Like, it sounds like a lot, but RuPaul is on record saying that Ru and Matthew used to take five or six hours to get ready for filming. But damn, my back hurts just thinking about it. Kamara's fashion. Let's talk about it. You know what? Actually, it speaks for itself. Her lady look, phenomenal. Lady, but first lady. At Biden's inaugural address, waving goodbye to the Oompa Loompa, looking forward into the future, sipping that sweet, sweet tea of justice. It's fashion, but it's also self-aware. She's not taking herself too seriously, which I think is a big flaw of some of the traditional fashion queens, as it were. She has her teacup. She's keeping it campy, whimsical, silly, but has a level of beauty, elegance, class, sophistication that I love to look at, but, you know, could never relate to. That tea she's sipping is hot. <laughs> Her vamp look. It's giving me rich vampire of the 18th century just got out of her bloodbath and is heading to her library in the castle to catch up on some light reading. You know, the encyclopedia of the world. In a vintage Moogler dress, no less. Call me cliche, but I am a <gasps> for Moogler. If only I could afford it. It's probably all I would wear. The taste level, immaculate. She came for blood. And this look is in the challenge, well, she was in the challenge, wasn't she? She was there. I did see her on the stage. And didn't she look beautiful? Almost beautiful enough to distract from the fact the lyrics and dance skills were not up to par with the rest of the girls. Her performance was a rot, but damn, she looked hot. On the runway, she comes to life. Ross was critiquing her, again, about the clothes hanger thing and saying that she is like the mannequin in the Kim Cattrall movie. But I definitely see her come to life when she is feeling her fantasy. That's when I think she is at her best. And on the runway, she absolutely shines. She has her Kim Cattrall moment. You just have to appreciate it when she's having it. This look is giving me just bought a new car and the rims are so expensive that she took them off, wore them as earrings because she didn't want them to get stolen and then made it to the runway at the last second. She says this is Britney meets Cher, yes. But like Britney once she's free from the conservatorship and then has her Cher era later in her life. Hashtag free Britney. Honestly, this look is so expensive that maybe she could like sell it and pay for Britney's legal fees. Anyways, she really put the other girls out of sheer this with this look. It's hot. Before we move into the tops and the bottoms, well, girl, RuPaul, oh my God. Ru is looking so good this season. That orange, <gasps> I dream sickle of RuPaul and orange. Absolutely hot. Our top two this week are Denali and Rose. Denali takes the win, but Tamisha really stole our hearts, I think. No one goes home and no one deserves to, and the real competition starts next week. My hottest hot this week goes to Tamisha Iman. I also ask my patrons every single week to vote for their hottest hot, and they also voted for Tamisha Iman. Girl, when it's right, it's right. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next week. Love you. Bye. Hi, Ugly. It's me, Bussy. And welcome back to Hot or Rat. And today, we'll be reviewing episode four of RuPaul's Drag Race season 13. <gasps> the one where somebody finally goes home. Today, our queens acted in Rue Hallmark Channel Originals, parodies of the Hallmark holiday movies. And on the main stage, category was trains for days. And for all my Brits watching, that's tubes for days. Before we get started, I want to remind you to click like if you're happy this season finally left the station and to press subscribe if the train's still running. Now, let's get this train to chugging. All aboard! First up, she is serving every single color of the train bow. It's Denali. 
She's giving us a Quetzalcoatl fantasy, which is a deity of Mesoamerican and Mexican culture. Immediately, I love this because it's so fresh. I'm also loving we're seeing her step out of her box, not only in terms of her fashion, but also with her makeup, the flames and the eyes were a really great touch there. She's going the extra mile. It's giving me Quetzalcoatl, but it's also giving me like Rainbow Phoenix meets like Carnival Rocker Chick. It's very unique in the way that she interpreted this deity. She's kind of got two trains going on. She has the Mohawk, which is kind of acting as a train and the actual train of the dress in, as she clarifies, ostrich feathers. This look is a hat. <laughs> While she may have perched high up in the runway category, in the main challenge, she kind of fell flat. She was the conductor, as it were, of her little group. As the lead person in the group, I think it's really your job to keep up the pace in an acting skit like this. And it's very obvious if your performance is kind of stiff. She derailed not only herself, but her group. This performance was a rat. Next stop, Livy Lux. She's giving us an instant classic and this, oh my God, Beethoven classical music composer fantasy. It, it is beyond my wildest dreams of what I could have ever imagined somebody would do with a train runway. Something about it, like the way that lavender coat has all that little lacy detailing in the print and then that gold applique like along the hem of the coattails, the actual coat, I mean, it's just, beautiful. And she's carrying a little campy gold heart. Olivia Lux is another one that just keeps surprising. This is high drag, high glamour, high camp, and it really is a high note <laughs> for Olivia. This look was an ace in the coal. It was hot. <laughs> in the challenge. She was the only one of her group that made me laugh. So I think she deserves a lot of credit for that because girl, I'm sure her back was real sore from carrying that group. Performance was a Next up, Elliot with two T's, two chugs, and two chews. <laughs> um, uh, this is another kind of 80s era inspired fashion moment from Elliot. This time, I'm not really loving it. She looks gorgeous, but that really never is the problem with Elliot. For me tonight, it's more about the concept that concerned me. She says she's trying to give us a little bit Glenn Close, but on closer inspection, I'm really just seeing an Amazon white lacy catsuit with a studded belt that has a tool train attached to it. It's just very understated for the runway. And you know, trains for days. There is so much evident of what we've already seen and what we will see. You can do with this category. And I think she really just kind of forgot to put the coal in the broiler. This one is gonna be a rat. In the challenge, she was giving us this sort of like ditzy prom queen kind of fantasy. It was an interesting take on the character and I think like it had its good moments, especially, you know, juxtaposed to Kimura's very wooden performance as the tree. You know, she was a bit more lively and I think understood her lines and gave a good performance. We'll, we'll put this in at a warming up. Next up, this How to Train Your Dragon sequel is looking pretty good. It's Kimura Hall. This is instantly iconic. <laughs> I am so, so upset with what happened this episode. Not because I don't think the outcome was what should have happened, but because we are not going to get to see the rest of Kimura's runways. The unaired runways of Kimura Hall, I think are going to leave the children shaking, gagged, bound, and chained. This is a serve. She took a train runway and then made a dragon costume out of it, which not only was extremely glamorous and fashionable, but also didn't take itself too seriously. You know, she's got the dragon shoulder pads, and then you look on the back, it was almost cartoonish and contrasting those two things, I think is a really fun thing to do. This is like Dragon Tales <laughs> meets Game of Thrones at the cross section of high drag glamour. She's dripping in gold. I'm dying to see her treasure trove and y'all already know. This look is in the challenge. Her not knowing the Tyra Banks reference, I'm not sure she didn't know it or if she just didn't understand how to place the emphasis on the words, maybe a combination of the two. And in her performance, I'm also not sure she totally understood all of the puns that she was delivering, which was crazy because kudos to the writers of her character, they packed that <gasps> full of puns. And I didn't laugh once. And I was like, girl, you, you gotta, you gotta deliver them. You gotta sell it to me. The performance was just too stiff. It was a rat. Next up, season 13, girl, let's just call the whole thing off <laughs> and give Simone the crown already. My God. She's serving us this icy teal Y2K tracksuit. It's so glamorous in all the wrong ways. And that's just part of Simone's fashion brand that I love so much. The train is on the do-rag. <laughs> like, Iconic. There's also these little subtle moments of applique on the pants, like the very bottom of the tracksuit that are matching the corset on the inside that's like zipped open in the front. It's infuriating almost to watch. Like how can she be funny, perfect, beautiful, a model? Oh, she checks all the boxes and I'm just in my bedroom 
Anyways, she can't do nothing wrong. She looks hot. In the challenge, y'all already know, she took all the girls to the cleaners and the factory. <laughs> Your mama, we already found our winner. Like. Simone's Drag Race, it's over. She's actually not even gonna win. She's just gonna replace RuPaul as the main host of the show for every episode going forward. I would be happy with that, would you? Let me know down in the comments below. It was hot, obviously. Next up, It's La La Ri. How is my parcel tongue, by the way? The gel Slytherins understand that? Do I fit in? Okay, this look, she looks great. Problem is I'm really just having such a love freight relationship with this one because it feels almost unfinished. It's like missing nails, um, some snake jewelry. You know, I, just, I was just waiting for that, that reveal to go to the next level. Even after she shed her outer layer, it was just a reveal to more snake print stuff that fit really well and made her look gorge. But the concept, I think it just didn't reach its final destination, you know? I'm charmed, but I'm not in love. It's a rat. In the main challenge, she failed to come to life, which is really strange because we're seeing so much charisma and personality from Lala Ree in the confessionals, but in the acting challenge, I feel like she just didn't know how to translate and put herself into that character. It was a rat. Also, what's going on with the Tamisha and Lala Ree storyline? I feel like somebody said at some point that they were drag mother and daughter. Was them being in the same drag house like a crazy rumor that I read on the internet? I don't know. Anyways, next up, curtains for spring? <sighs> Groundbreaking, it's Utica. She's giving us a look inspired by Carol Burnett's Gone with the Wind, iconic. Please go watch it, it's on YouTube. This look very much is that look that Carol Burnett was wearing in this skit, but kind of done in the Utica flavor. She's glammed it up. It's a satin fabric instead of a mat. It, it looks very, very pretty. And actually I think loses some of the elements of silliness of the original, but I still love it. One thing it's missing from that original look is like the hat. It seems like maybe she translated that into just being a belt or maybe she ran out of time and didn't have that, but really that's just a small cold plaint from me. God, it was a hot. In the challenge, she was like this hippie dippy kind of character. The moment of RuPaul laughing in the workroom had me rolling on the floor. That was the funniest moment of the entire episode, maybe of the entire season so far. The performance felt a little confused. I wasn't totally vibing with it, but I'm gonna give it a soft hot. Next up, it's Rose LLC. <laughs> She's fully incorporated in her business <gasps> look of the 80s. She's giving me Melanie Griffith and Working Girl, but like at the end of the movie when she becomes the boss, but with the cool hair from the beginning. But I do have some complaints for HR. There was so much blue on the outfit. She kind of just turned into a giant like blob on the stage. There needed to be more contrast on the look. Like the moments of silver on the collar of the jacket and the one or two buttons that were there were great, but like, let's bring that down to the pant leg. Maybe let's put some of that in the actual train. Cause it, it, she just was like a cloud with no dimension. It's a little and not enough train. This look is a rat. In the challenge, Rose surprised, I think because the editors kind of gave her that like overconfident going to flop edit. But it turns out she actually knows how to act. It was hot. Next up, it's Gottmik and she's bringing the train's flag with her down the runway. Immediately, I love the message of what she's doing here and I think she looks drop dead <gasps> gorgeous. But I think her train got a little bit derailed. I don't know, I wanted more from the train. Like it kind of felt more like a flag, you know, which I think very much was the message than an actual train. I think this outfit was missing some structure. The bodice itself, the nude illusion part of it, I wasn't in love with. The structure also I think would have helped with keeping all those little chiffon pieces maybe in a certain formation or fashion because she kind of just looked like pretty woman caught in a windstorm and by, by the fabric store. <laughs> I wish I could say that's hot, but this look didn't blow me away. It was a rat. In the challenge, she was a great narrator for her skit. She was able to keep everybody on track. She has some good acting chops and I think she's really proving that she's quite versatile and is not just gonna be a look queen in this competition. I was also loving the look in this. It was very like Sarah Palin, maybe unintentionally, not sure, but it was cute. And the performance was hot. Next up, she's burning a coal on the runway. It's Tina Burner. And you better have your tickets ready because this ain't the subway, okay? This conductor is gonna be checking every single person's identification as they board her train. The look overall is very like Budapest Hotel meets Thomas. I mean, 
Tina the train. The doll-like makeup is fun. All of the details are a delight, I think, to see as you look up and down the look. You know, she's got the conductor outfit on, okay? The train is like the literal railroad track. She's got a little smokestack on the top where the train would blow the whistle as a hat. I mean, she was really thinking about everything here. The only thing that was really confusing for me was like the extra tool skirt moment thing that was like sewn onto the arms as she's walking down the runway. And as funny as having the train tracks as the train of her outfit was, they also felt like a little bit of an afterthought. I think she could have incorporated the design of the outfit into the design of the actual train just a tad better. This look checked so many of the right boxes for me, but also a couple of the wrong ones. And for that reason, I'm gonna leave this one at a warming up. In the challenge, Tina plays a great villain. She is the true thespian of the cast, and that's perfectly clear to me. Her performance was certainly hot. And rolling onto our next stone tonight, it's Joey J. When she walked out immediately, I hated it. I I was like, what the hell is going on here? She's got like Japanese cherry blossoms on her chest shirt. And this very like S&M meets goth punk ballerina outfit on. And then she's got like the top braid pony that is attached into the headwear that she's wearing. And then the cyborg glasses. Like, where, where are these references coming from? How is she putting them all together? I think this was just sort of a case of she tried to do way too many things. And I'm not even done describing the look. Okay, when she turns around, then you see this giant tongue as the train with like the piercing and that is coming out of the lips. And that I loved. I loved that train. But I think you have to be really careful Careful when you're putting all these disparate elements together and making sure that they're not wearing you and that you are wearing them. This Dom and Train tricks look was a rock for me. In the challenge, Joey J was kind of awkward as he is. He's this like quirky little fun, cute, adorable dude that you just want to <laughs> like pinch his cheeks. His acting was strange, but he did kind of turn it out. This caboose was a hot for me. Next up, bless her coal. It's Candy Muse. This look. It's giving me like soundproof padded movie theater curtain wall vibes. And then like the centerpiece of the dress is the lighting fixture hanging from the wall. And the actual light coming from it is her bright blonde wig. It's this velvet red gown with some little structured corset pieces holding everything together. I think it was really missing a concept. Overall, this just really wasn't her runway and there was barely a train to speak of on the actual garment. The category was trains for days and she's giving me like trains for seconds. There's just a wisp of a train flashing by. It's one of like Elon Musk's boring tunnel trains that going at hyper speed just so fast you didn't even know what happened. This train got a bit ahead of itself and stopped in Ratsville. But, but, Candy Muse in the challenge this week, I was so gagged. She was so funny as the loud clown and what like a perfect role to give Candy because she loves stealing a show. She loves having a moment. Turns out she's got a big bag of tracks. This performance was hot. And trainily, she's got two arms and two legs in the pink. It's Tamisha Amon. She's giving us this pink, lacy, glittery cat suit, pants suit mashup with a little pink tutu that turns into a train. It's very um, pageant casual. Like this is for when you have the board meeting at five and the pageant at six. <laughs> It's exactly what I expected from Tamisha. And for that reason, I was a little disappointed. I, I wanted her to take this to the next level. We know that she can construct a pretty garment. We know that she looks gorgeous on the runway, but what we're missing from Tamisha in the competition is really starting to approach this from a competitive standpoint. She did something very safe on the runway. Gorgeous in her own unique flavor, but a little uninspired overall. I'm gonna leave this one at a warming as for Tamisha in the challenge, we saw a light in Tamisha come to life. I didn't expect her to be such a great little actress, but she really did that. Her performance as Cher, well, you know, Cher inspired, was hot. <laughs> Our episode winner this week is Simone. And in the bottom two, we have Denali, Kamora Hall. I can definitely understand Denali being in the bottom because she was the leader of her group and you know, if the leader fails, she should be the one to take the fall. Kamora's acting was definitively bad in the main challenge. But like, at what point are the judges going to start counting the runways as taking somebody just a bit above and beyond somebody that did, I think, equally as bad in the challenge? Because I think if the runway is supposed to be the tiebreaker there, well, girl Miss Kimura, she ran and took that tie and tied it in a knot and a bow. She really brought it home on the runway and they put her up against Denali. They could have also done like a Kimura and La La Ree bottom two. I will say watching it, I felt so bad for Kimura. Denali put the knife in her back and 
and just kept twisting and twisting and <laughs> twisting. We witnessed a murder on that stage in this episode. Komura may never recover. And Denali, well, can we get her in the bottom two every single week to see her lip sync? Because she is so, so good. Anyways, Denali lives to see another week. And as for my hottest <sighs> on the runway this week, that goes to Simone. I also asked my patrons over on patreon.com slash bussyqueen to vote for their hottest hot. And this week they've chosen Kamora Hall. My patrons truly make my channel possible. And you can join my Patreon family over at patreon.com slash bussyqueen to get exclusive member benefits like exclusive video content, your name and credits, personal shout outs, and access to the Bussy Queen Discord server to chat with me and other patrons. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. Love you. Bye. Hi, Ugly. It's me, Bussy, and welcome back to Hot or Rot. And today we'll be reviewing the bag ball from RuPaul's Drag Race season 13. Today our girls were challenged to serve three looks on the runway. Mixed bag, a look based off of bag puns. Money bag, a look based off of looking expensive and carrying a coach bag down the runway. And finally, a bag eleganza look constructed there in the workroom using bag materials provided by Drag Race. And yes, that's 36 bags. 38 if you count the two under my eyes. We've got a lot to break down tonight, but before we get started, I want to remind you to press like if you're into reusable shopping bags and to press subscribe if you want to end world hunger. And I also want to give you a quick reminder that my channel is made possible by my generous patrons over on patreon.com. That's my members only website where in exchange for just a few dollars a month my patrons get access to exclusive content like lip sync reaction videos, my deleted video archive, early access to my videos, personal shout outs, the Bussy Queen Discord where my patrons can chat with me and other patrons and more. So what are you waiting for? Click the link in the description of this video to join my patron family today at patreon.com com slash buzzy queen. Thanks. Now, let's unpack these looks. First up, she just finished her shift over at the NHTSA. It's Denali. Her pun is airbag, and she is the literal crash test dummy from a car crash. It's giving me like Coraline meets Gaga and the Alexander McQueen references that she's going for. I love the little creases on her legs, making her actually look like that crash test dummy, the huge airbag shoulder silhouettes, and she even has a little steering wheel that she is just curving and swerving down the runway with. It was very smart. I think this look was hot. Next up. She owns 101% of this fashion house. She's giving us like a Cruella de Vil kind of fantasy for her money bag runway. It very much is giving me that rich bitch vibe, but I wanted more out of it. Like if we're gonna go Cruella de Vil, I wanna see someone do a full like Dalmatian print ball gown on the runway. The best part about it was that little cigarette holder attached to her five inch nail. That was pretty iconic. So this look for me, the flame has just gone out, but it's still smoldering and you know, warm enough for me to give a hot. And finally, her look made of bags. Day of the Dead? Girl, we need to lay this one to rest. The giant cage thing that's like floating around her made zero sense to me. The actual garment has that giant black piece down the middle where I really wish she would have connected the two sides of the dress. And I think if, again, she had adjusted that makeup, left off the cage, and then brought the entire dress together in one piece, not exposed the corset underneath, could have been a hot. I think she really had the right idea to approach this from a cultural heritage standpoint and give us something that was definitely unique among the cast of girls. I think maybe we could have had a hot, but as it is, girl, I'm deceased. And this look is too. It's a rat. Next, entering the ring, it's Livia Lux. This was so unfortunate for Olivia because obviously she had no idea that Simone was going to like win a challenge in a previous episode in a boxing outfit for the Lemay runway. The pun on this was punching bag, a very fun way to approach this runway, but I think it really failed to pack a punch, especially in the eyes of the judges and as a viewer because we've already seen this. Even though this look was a repeat of Simone's round one, I still think it was a total knockout. It's hot. Next up, I just checked the Wall Street Bets Reddit and they're saying the next hottest stock is Olivia Lux's money bag look. She's giving me that rich woman fantasy walking down Fifth Avenue on her lunch break. She's even got the coffee to prove it. I love the cape with that lining that has those kind of like striped tie material on the inside. It's, it's gorgeous. She gave me Meryl Streep on Wall Street and this look was hot. I also am going to start pretending that they're not even carrying these insane coach bags. And because they were sort of forced upon the girls, I'm also not going to be like judging them based on what they did to their bags. Cause girl, they were all messes. For her made of bags look, when the Chromatica 2 into 911 transition hits, <laughs> she's cut bags into like pieces of 
armor around her body, and she's even got a little like applique piece on her face. If I were going to improve it, I probably would have streamlined that silhouette just a little bit, maybe connected the bra top to the skirt. Something about that crop section is a little awkward feeling, especially when she's moving around on the runway. It just feels very PC. But even without those modifications, this look is a chromatic hot. <laughs> Next up, she's got two T's and two handles on her dress tonight. It's Elliot. Her mixed bag runway pun is gift bag. Is it the most creative thing in the world? Maybe not, but it is cute. You know, she's got the little gift tissue around her neck on the top of the dress and the handles as nipple tassels. That was pretty smart. You gotta give it to her. She's also carrying a little handbag down the runway that looks like the gift tag of the gift bag that says to RuPaul. I have a feeling RuPaul's already eyeing that return policy. <laughs> It's not bad, I mean bad. I'm gonna give this one a hot. <laughs> as for her money bag look, I'm not exactly sure what she was going for here. I'm getting kind of like Madonna as a superintendent vibes. I feel like this look does look well constructed and she looks pretty, but it's missing like some oomph. Maybe had some sort of reveal where she takes off the tuxedo and reveals some like S&M gear underneath to sort of turn this look into a dominatrix fantasy because I'm, I'm getting those vibes, but I'm not sure why and I want her to tell me the rest of the story. For me, it's a rat. Her final look, bag eleganza. I think maybe she used a bean bag to construct this. This was the first time I looked at one of Elliot's look and totally bought the fantasy. It very much is giving me her classic 80s flair, but it also takes me in a new direction. It's, it's a little more fashion forward. Maybe it's the print, the cut of the top, something, but it's doing it for me. I'm loving it and I think it's absolutely Overall, I think Elliot could really use with some more diversity in this competition, especially looking at three different looks. She's got basically the same exact blonde hair on every single time. She looked bored on the runway half the time, and I'm sure she didn't intend to, but it just came off disinterested. Next up, knock knock, it's Simone. This look is very much giving me Jessica Rabbit meets Diana Ross meets Rogue from X-Men with that hair. I like the fun little twist that she has done to make this her own. Her pun for this mixed bags look is fun bags. She's referring obviously to like her balloon titties that she pops at the end of the runway. Again, another fun campy twist. This look, popper. I hardly know her. Very hot. As for her money bags look, I just fall more and more in love with Simone every time I see her walk down the runway. She is giving us a Chris Tucker in Fifth Element as Ruby Rod fantasy, and it is so amazing. In this look, she is the moment. She is the future. She is the rich space goddess that is stunting on all the hose in her beautiful pink satin fabric with those beautiful little leg cutouts just to remind you that, yeah, she has the best legs on the runway, period. She has an excellent way of pulling in these references from pop culture, but very much making them her own. She's not just wearing a costume, she's wearing fashion. This look is hot, it's hotter than hot, it's hot, hot, hot. For her bag eleganza, let's go to the beach, each. Let's go get away. She looks good, but you kind of see like, oh, she has great taste. But I was surprised to learn that she wasn't the one making any of her garments. She was able though to put together something very safe. It's just red and white bags kind of put together into a bra top and panties. I also like that she incorporated parts of the bags into that excellent hair in the braid. She very much is the 50s pinup lifesaver copper tone model of this runway, and she does look great. This look is hot. Next up, let's take another trip to the graveyard, but this time for Lala Re. Her pun on mixed bag is bag of bones. Really great concept. I loved the bag around her feet. That's like part of the gown, but the rest of it, I was like, girl, why did you give up on this look one tenth of the way through making it? She looks literally like a skeleton that was put into a bag shaken up and then just like strewn upon the table. If she had just done a little bit more than glue spirit Halloween props to a black cat suit dress, maybe this could have been good, but as it is, it's a rat. As for her money bag look, she is giving me Iman meets Lisa Frank in this beautiful rainbow leopard dress with peplum, shoulder pads, lots of shape. It is so gorgeous. The choice to go bald was certainly bold, but it paid off on this money bag runway. This look is hot. However, her bag eleganza runway, girl, the audacity. You know what? It do take nerve to walk the runway in this type of look with that level of confidence. She literally glued five pink and blue bags to a bodysuit and said, eat it judges. And then she has this like furry little purse on her head too. I'm like, girl, unfortunately you can judge some bags by the, their covers. And this one is a rot through and through. Next up, wait a second. Are we back in the <gasps> ball again? It's Utica. 
Her first look is doggy bag and it's so fabulous. It's so gorgeous. This is fashion forward. It's unique. It very much is Utica. It has her stamp on it and she's playing it up. The chain coming down in front of the bow with all the ruffles on the top and those pinstripe pants just, ugh. I'm barking for more. This look is hot. In her money bag look, she's giving us like a Carol Burnett fantasy. It's very cute. It's kind of giving me a little bit of Edna Mole from The Incredibles meets Coconut Head from that like Nickelodeon show, Ned's Declassified. It's cute fun, fresh, but am I really getting like money bag from this runway? Not necessarily. Maybe she was trying to invoke that with those giant gold hoops hanging down the front of that top, but I still liked the look. It was fun and unique. And I think she does deserve credit. And for that reason, this look for me was hot. <laughs> Finally, her bag eleganza look proves that you should not be sleeping on Utica. Wow. The judges said it. This is one of the best looks that has ever walked through RuPaul's Drag Race runway. It's giving me like Tonberry from Final Fantasy meets Diseased Snake. It's very bizarre. It's very strange. We're entering that realm of darkness that inspires a lot of her looks and it's so amazing. Not only that, but it's also extremely well constructed. She caught some Z's and some H-O-T's. <laughs> Overall, I was really confused when the judges didn't give her the win. Maybe it was because her looks didn't connect like through and through, although that wasn't really part of the ball. And her looks weren't really flashy in the way that let's say got mix were, but we'll get to those in just a minute. Next up, Great Scott. It's Rose. Her bag pun is bagpipes and she's giving a little homage to her Scottish heritage. Very smart. Although immediately I'm like, okay, we've We've seen this silhouette on Rosé, but it looks great on her. I love the campy details of all the windpipes going down her sleeves. Also, the Ducatch with the plaid is like that red pinkish color. She is always on brand, you better believe it. This look is hot. Next up for her money bag look, she is doing a Bette Midler look from the movie Big Business. I think it's a great interpretation of the look from the movie and the character is, you know, kind of like that rich <gasps> CEO type of attitude. It's actually one of my favorite looks that I've ever seen Rosé in. She looks adorable and somehow fresher, even though it's a total throwback. Have it on her desk by five. No, make it four. This look is hot. Finally, for her bag eleganza look, she's giving us Rosie the Robot. It again is that same silhouette. That said, the look is well constructed. She absolutely sells it. It has a, a level of movement and attention to detail that many of the other looks didn't have. So although she gave us three of the almost exact same silhouette uh, on the runway tonight, this look is a Rosie the Robe hot. Next up, rolling in on a gurney. Scott Mick. Her pun is body bag. She's giving us a dead body, literally. <laughs> Putting all the rhinestones inside of the guts that are hanging outside of her outfit. Very smart because those end up connecting to her second and third looks. But when you look at this look and you're, you kind of take away the cool factor that she has around it, it really is just like a nude cat suit with a black bib that has some guts like hang out of the front. Like it almost just seems too simple, but maybe that's why it works so well. Got make looks great dead. Cause of death, fashion. This look is hot. Next up, her money bag look. Rich, 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 expensive. Also one of the best looks we probably have ever seen on RuPaul's Drag Race runway. I love that she kept the spook of the dead body bag look in this, that black and white hair and then the black and white pinstripes, very smart to pair those two together. And then like just the cut of the dress trouser pants that she's wearing, exposing that silver rhinestone bra also very smart. She put her signature got make stamp on this look, served it to us, made us eat it, and I want seconds, thirds, maybe even fourths. This look is hot. As for her final look, Bag Eleganza, if you love rock and roll, you'll probably love this look. Another stunning look from Gottmik, but I was almost like kind of mad at myself for liking it because it's so stupidly simple. She has these like little triangular bag pieces kind of just chains together with various strap pieces going down one side of her body. You know, our queens can get stuck overthinking and trying to do too many details and too many things. And Gottmik says, you know what? I'm gonna keep it simple. And she killed it. She absolutely killed it. It. This is also one of those looks that you put this on anybody else and it would look terrible. Gomic is the only person in the world that could pull this off. Gomic had this ball in the bag from A to Z. This look was hot. 
The judges gave her the win. I think mostly probably for that second look, that money ball look was a total gag. She also was the only queen to tie all three of her looks together with like that silvery kind of theme. And she was so fresh feeling, so glitzy, glammy, rock and roll. She's the cool girl in school. She's the Regina George that you want to punch you in the face because you're gonna enjoy it. Anyways, next up, it's Tipsy Burn. Her bag pun is a uh, brown bag. The gown on her looks gorgeous. The skirt part of the dress is made of bottles and it still looks so glamorous and beautiful on her. She's also got that very like party girl's hair. She looks drunk while she's walking down the runway. She is selling me the fantasy of the pun that is her outfit. It's so great. She's even got like a liquor store sign as a necklace. I think this look was hot. As for her money bag look, I was sinking my hound's teeth into this look. It looks expensive. It's giving me Chanel 80s meets Lee Bowery as a corporate CEO businesswoman. It's perfect. I also love the detail of her wig peeking out of the hat. Tina is always including amazing tiny little secrets that you discover as you look closer and closer. This is high drag, high camp, ball realness, selling a fantasy. I love it. I'm buying everything she's selling and this look is hot. As for her ball Elganza look, she's got to drop the red and yellow thing. Too often she looks like Ronald <gasps> McDonald, but the look is good. I'm trying to figure out exactly what she was going for. It's almost like Raggedy Ann doll in the 20s. Time travels to Paris. It is strange, but you cannot say that the garment is not impeccably made with a fascinator hat to boot. It's strange, but Tina's looks were so strong. In fact, I actually would have swapped her for Rose in the top three, just because she's giving us stuff that is fresher, more fun, campier. But I think the judges clearly favorite Rose and very much are trying to pit Tina Burner as kind of the villain against almost the rest of the cast as it feels from viewers' perspective. Anyways, give her some more credit, show her some love, look past the edit that they're giving her because there's a lot of good with Tina Burner's runways. Next up, she's G-A-Y. It's Joey, J-A-Y. This first look for her mixed bag runway is uh, giving us a nurse meets debatably poison ivy fantasy. It is a great concept, assuming in fact she did know exactly what she was doing, but the look itself is not amazing. It's basically just like a contoured bodysuit with rhinestones and then like pieces of white plastic with syringes attached with some very cheap looking leaves. And then overall, it just looks unfinished. This look could have used an infusion of fashion. For me, it's a rat. Next up, her money bag look. This was one of the first times that I looked at Joey J on the runway and thought, wow, she looks great. It's Kill Bill meets soccer player lesbian fantasy in the office. I love the rhinestones on the shoulder, how there's like little subtle red uh, swirly pieces going down those pant legs and then the red just really tying everything together. We also do know that Joey works in software and I was looking at the binary on the coach purse that she put on there. <laughs> put that into a translator. I got an F, a U, and then error messages. I'm hypothesizing that she was intending to spell F-U-C-K, but had a little bit of a bug. Ignoring that, however, I think this look is a 01000010001011101010100. And finally, Joey J goes to the prom. Her bag eleganza look. She says it's Madonna meets Gaga meets Minnie Mouse. I see that fantasy exactly as she says. However, I think the part that was really missing for me was it's hard for my eye to discern the different pieces in parts of what she's wearing. It all just blends together. It's a little strange. Definitely left me seeing spots. This look is a rat. Next up, Abra, Candy Muse Abra, Alakazam. Candy's pun is bag of tricks. She is giving us a magician fantasy that I am in love with. She walks out, she's pulling things out. She pulls out a giant stick and then a magician's wand that turns the bag into a cape. This is so great. She's doing a character, giving us a performance. She's doing magic tricks on the runway and turning an accessory into a piece of fashion. This look is prestigious and hot. Next up, her money bag look. It's giving me kind of like invasion of privacy vibes for some reason. Maybe it's something to do with the way that the hair is fitting as literal money rolls. Because it is evoking that Cardi B fantasy, I think it very much does feel super fresh and relevant to modern pop culture. I think she does look rich. She's selling me that sort of of arrogant 
And uh, new money fantasy on the runway with this. She's got a blunt made of money. She's so rich. I don't know if she's got red bottoms on to complete this sexy lingerie fantasy, but this look is hot. And finally her bag eleganza look. I think it was really strong, but overall just got outshined by the competition. The best part of this is that bandeau that she has created of different pieces of bags. You don't even know that she used bags to make that top part. And I think that would have really helped her out at the bottom part was like that as well. This schoolgirl did her homework, but maybe didn't turn in the extra credit while some of the other kids in the class did, but it still gets a hot. And while we're on the subject of lecturing, Candy yelling and untucked, whoa. Mama, that was a lot. Her, the Tamisha and Candy fight will go down in untucked history as best fights, absolutely, but it was best fight to watch in a very uncomfortable way. Like I was just wanting it to be over the entire time because it felt so real, whereas some of the other fights felt so silly that are iconic. And this one was just raw and lots of yelling. I had a fear that they were seriously going to fight each other. And this ain't RuPaul's best friends race, but it's also not RuPaul's best fist race. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe mixing puns there, it's late. And finally, it's Tamisha Amon, the subject of controversy tonight. And for her mixed bag look, she's giving us that old bag, a metaphorical bag, if you will, a literal old lady. In my opinion, the way that she played this character on the runway was top tier of this category. It's also funny because she's been doing drag for 30 years and you would expect her to look like that in drag normally, but she doesn't. She looks like a beautiful woman. So she was not only funny, but found a way to make a joke about herself. And if you can't laugh at yourself, how in the hell are you gonna laugh at anybody else? This look is hot. Next up. <laughs> Green is the color of money, but this fantasy. She said that she's going for like real woman in Atlanta fantasy, but I don't think that was really the challenge. The challenge was to look like that untouchable rich woman of the business office, essentially, right? And she's giving me everyday woman. I was also surprised to see her in that flat out of the bag wig. So unlike her, it was almost like she just kind of gave up tonight. It's definitely a rot. And finally, her bag eleganza look. This look is bad, but not in the way that you think it would be. It is meticulously crafted. Like when you zoom in and look at all the details, there are panels, there are glued on little gym pieces, and it's just surprising, again, that somebody with this much experience and ability to create jaw-dropping looks like the one we saw on the sheer runway can also put together something like this. This look is carefully crafted garbage. It's a rot. Although I would have given the win this week to Utica for that insane look. I think the judges got the bottom three correct and the bottom two perfectly right. They were kind of having to choose between Tamisha's complete lack of taste, but great ability to construct a garment and then Joey J's lack of taste and inability to construct a garment. And then Lala Ree's random bags glued to a bodysuit. <laughs> I will never get over that look. She deserves to lip sync for that lack of effort alone. And then the next choice I think was obvious, Joey J. None of Joey's looks super impressed me, while Tamisha did at least have one that I was happy with. Bamba Ree sends Joey J home in the lip sync and Gottmik takes the win. And as much as I love Gottmik and believe that she has the it factor and probably will win the competition, I love an underdog. So my hottest hot this week goes to Utica. I also asked my patrons to vote for their hottest hot over on patreon.com slash buzzyqueen and this week they've chosen Utica. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next week. Love ya, bye. Hi ugly, it's me, Crystal Ballsy Queen. Get it because I predicted this bottom two in my last video and welcome back to Hot or Rot. Today I'll be breaking down the Dress Runways from RuPaul's Drag Race Season 13, Episode 6, talking a little bit about that discommentary challenge and discussing whether or not I think the bottom two was correct this week. It wasn't. But more on that later. Before we get started, I want to remind you to click like if you're excited the circus is in town and to remind you to press subscribe if you're into cheap tricks like me. Now, without any more panic, let's get into it. First up, where there's smoke, there's Tina. Wearing a fire. Tina Burner, I have a challenge for you. Get some new wardrobe colors, please. I seriously cannot believe that she made an entire RuPaul's Drag Race wardrobe 
runway collection out of three colors. But let's pretend that we haven't already seen Tina in Fifty Shades of Orange. This look is actually kind of cool. She comes out in like a wet paint costume and reveals to her little black dress that she very much has made her own. And like, it's supposed to be red, orange, and yellow wet paint dripping down in the bottom part of the dress. And there's like handprints where the workers were, you know, fuddling her nether regions. At the same time, something about when she hits the runway just doesn't feel fresh. And I think it's because of what we've already seen from her. I would love to see Tina completely burn down the closet that has all these clothes in it and see her rise from the ashes because there's a phoenix in there. I feel it, I feel that star. For this runway, this look is actually pretty hot. Oh, and, and that phoenix that I was mentioning, we saw her in the main challenge. Back at the disco, Mama She was burning up the dance floor. She was such an amazing performer. She made Got Make and Candy look clueless up there. Smoking in the main challenge. Next up, are we Candy amused? But I predicted this entire episode in my last YouTube video. Candy comes out in this Comme des Garçons inspired look, which is also an homage to her drag mother, Aja, which is also has the 1994 Princess Diana revenge dress painted on top of it. Quick history lesson, it's called the revenge dress because this is the dress that she wore, which was super scandalous back in the day on the night that Charles admitted to adultery during their marriage. Candy also decided to do a little bit of like an oil spill fantasy in her hair and makeup. Not sure why she went there. Maybe it was supposed to look like the paint from the dress got into her mug, but it just kind of ended up looking a little bit messy in those areas. Like I saw this and kind of wished that she had just done a total recreation of Princess Diana's dress and then like, you know, made it ho as she does with her style. It was great when this dress cut originally hit the runway back in 2012. It was great when Lady Gaga paid homage to it. It was great when Aja wore it on the RuPaul's Drag Race runway, but it just feels so overdone. And for those reasons, this look for me is going to be a rat. In the main challenge, Candy seemed to think that the only reason she was in the bottom was because of the outfit she was wearing. And while it wasn't great, like it was okay. You know, I think it was a little weird for them to like particularly own in on that when really I believe it was Tina totally outperforming both Candy and Gottmik that made them look so bad. The problem is when you're being outshined that hard by somebody, I mean, girl, you gotta step it up or you just look like you have given up. It was a rot. Next up, honey, I've shrunk the drag queen's outfits. It's Gottmik. Minnie Mouse's long lost sister, Minnie Mick. This look is um bold and I'm sure she's cold as hell. I mean, she's literally wearing nothing on the runway except a little black dress. It's very on the nose, but it's also very cool. And this is another outfit. You put this on literally anybody else and you'd be like, ooh. That said, while it is unique for Gottmik, it isn't necessarily unique for the RuPaul's Drag Race runway. My mind goes to, for example, Valentina's censored bars runway, Carmen Carrera's mini body yaddy yaddy runways, Courtney Axe slumber party runway. I mean, we have seen this before, but it is fresh for Gottmik. I also love that she turns around and you see that she has a bow on her. <gasps> Bussy. <laughs> How did she get that to stay there? I guess you could say she's dressed to thrill. This look is hot. In the main challenge, if you play back her performance, she actually is out of sync, doing her own thing, dancing on her own, not hitting the choreography. <laughs> I mean, hey, like I would have been in the exact same boat there, girl, I got, I've got two left feet. But it was just shocking to me that the judges completely didn't even mention it, just glazed right over it. I wonder why, maybe it was because they wanted the Tamisha versus Candy lip sync. Hmm. Gottmik is a super freak, but performance was a rat. Next up, it's Elliot with two T's and two tones in her hair, just like every suburban mother. Deadass, I thought that she stole this out of my grandmother's funeral casket. <laughs> it not only aged her in a way that wasn't flattering, like it's pretty, but good God, is it boring. Where's the concept? Where's the freshness? Give me something to gag on. I was so bored, I, I gagged and choked on my own tongue just for a little excitement. And I'm not trying to come for her too hard, but also, my God, can we get somebody to please teach her how to walk on a runway? She is stiff. She is literally a corpse coming down the runway in this luck. And girl, that corpse is rotted. 
However, in the main challenge, for somebody so stiff, it's mind-blowing that she can also bust a move with the best of them. Like, what? She shut the goddamn door on the other girls, and there was a panic at the disco, and there was a fire burning, and it was so, so hot. Next up, it's Tamisha. Whoa, man. This look is very pretty. It is classy. It is elegant and excellent. Perfectly crafted. But again, we've seen this thing from Tamisha on the runway where while her look is really, really pretty. There's no higher concept other than I'm attending a pageant. She clearly has the ability to craft amazing garments, but I think when she comes back from All Stars, she's gonna have to figure out how to take her style beyond just pretty. For a drag queen on the RuPaul's Drag Race runway, it's just not quite enough. This one is a soft hat for me. Now let's address Tamisha Amon's performance in the main challenge. Firstly, her disco look, Gag Nation. Literally the best one of the group. However, while she looked great, she was hesitant. And we learned why, it's because of her medical condition. She's trying to learn how to perform in the way that she once did, adapted to her new body's conditions. And my God, the confidence that it takes to enter RuPaul's Drag Race with this type of medical history is unheard of. I feel like the producers were really, really going and just gunning for that storyline of Candy versus Tamisha and were not looking close enough at how the queens were actually performing because there was so much to love there and she really did well. Next up, welcome to the jungle. It's Olivia Lux. Her look is giving me like rock and roll 80s hairband starlet attending the Grammys for her award show. It's really cute. It's not my favorite and I do wish there was a little bit more of a concept. The sequins on the front of her dress give it a really nice shape until you hit the part where the sequins end and you're like, wait, where did the shape go? And if she was indeed going for that little rock and roll starlet fantasy, I maybe would have loved to have seen her take that a bit further. Maybe rip it up, add some fringe. I don't know, of the little black dresses with no overarching concept, I think it was well done and she looks gorge. I'm gonna give this look a hot. Like I'm just a little bit nervous that Olivia is going to be resting on pretty almost too much because pretty's great, but the Drag Race judges are really gonna be looking for that extra little, you know, thing that sets somebody apart. Luckily for her, maybe it's performing because her live performance was a total gag, definitely deserving of a win because she absolutely came to life in that main challenge. Heaven must be missing an angel named Olivia Lux. This performance was hot. Next up, it's Utica. On first watch, I was like, what the hell is going on here? Girl, I thought she was giving us like a Wicked Witch of the West kind of fantasy from Wizard of Oz. And then once she started explaining to the judges what was going on, I was like, oh, that's really cool. But like, how would you ever expect anybody to get that? Sometimes getting a reference though is not needed because she still looks great. Like it's so insane, fresh, never been seen before. Utica is the only person that could imagine something like this. But this is what I want from a RuPaul's Drag race runway. I want a queen's brain to vomit on the runway and make us eat it up. I don't care that we didn't know she was creating an outfit based off of her earrings, but I maybe would have liked to have seen the dress cut a bit shorter for the little black dress runway. That's my only critique. Hook, giant red lip, and sinker. This look is in the main challenge, did she turn the beat around or was her performance a shame? I think this is going to divide a lot of people. I want you guys to let me know down in the comments below what you thought because when I watched it, I was like, oh, I love her interpretation of disco. That outfit was so fresh, but the judges had a different idea of what they wanted from these disco looks. It was like only something that would have fit in a Studio 54 in the 70s would have been appropriate to them. And this also kind of lines up with their critique of her performance. She very much made disco her own and they didn't like that, which is ironic because here we are giving a history lesson on an era that was about self-expression and freedom <laughs> and they're penalizing her for exactly that. Anyways, Utica does not enter the bottom two and she will survive for another week and I think this performance was hot. <laughs> Next up, I wonder if she ordered this look off the deep web. 
It's Denali. When she first hit the runway, I didn't get it. I thought she was just doing that very cliche idea of, oh, I'm a widow at my seventh husband's funeral going to collect my inheritance check type of thing. And it's funny because that is exactly what she's doing, but she turned it into a concept. Not only is she a black widow, but she is a spider black widow. Turns out she is the one killing her husbands and she's not afraid to show you her other, other eyes beneath her veil. Come a little closer. Yes. I also love that the more you look at this runway, you see that concept tied into so many little pieces. That Swarovski spider web on the back where her back cutout is, is so gorgeous. I just really love everything about this. And her eight eyes and eight legs, well, I'm gonna give them eight hats. <laughs> In the main challenge, we know Denali is a dancing queen, but is she a disco queen? Maybe not. Her and Rosé maybe were actually the strongest pair of the performance. Like if they were judging them based on groups, I think maybe they could have won. But Denali's individual outfit, I think really held her back in that. Because I don't think it was disco unless maybe she was like wearing the disco ball and the wet hair didn't match the dress and it really consumed her whole body. And when you're dancing, you know, you want that tighter, more form-fitting outfit, especially if you're doing disco, like Rosé had on, for example, to show off all of your dance moves. And girl, were you gagging? when she had her Jan moment on the runway, like you could just tell she was like, are you <gasps> kidding me? Even though that outfit needed a car wash, her performance still rang my bell and I think it was <laughs> Next up, comb de garçon on already. <laughs> This I don't think was intentionally referencing that runway in any way, shape or form, but it ended up kind of looking like it. She like has framed a little black dress in a box of gray tulle and then paired it with a gray hair. It ages her in a way that just, mm, not good. And let me clarify, I don't think looking old is a bad thing at all but I think when you're not doing it intentionally, it just looks wrong. Honestly, it, this look is just boring and I wanna know where's the goop, where's the gag? Rose has that talent, she has that star power. She's like playing it safe, like too safe. If I had to sum this look up in like one sentence, I would say it looks like a moldy Pop-Tart. If you age a Rose too long, it eventually becomes a rat. Next up, you looking for a good time? She'll make you sing. It's La La Ri. If you are gonna do hooker, girl, do hooker, do it. Because this is kind of like what happened with Rose. She achieved something that she wasn't necessarily going for and it just came off unfinished. Like, you know, hang a lip out, rip those fishnets. Maybe have money like falling out of your top or out of your coochie because that dress is so short. Like paint the bottom of your heels with red nail polish or something. Give me a fantasy. Instead, she gave me Forever 21 one little black dress that doesn't even fit her well. It just totally missed the mark for me. Basically, just look like Willem on the runway if you're going for cheap hooker. <laughs> this is what I'm talking about. If you wanna look cheap, bitch, <gasps> look cheap on purpose, okay? They call me the carousel back at the circus cause all the boys wanna take a ride. Woo! Anyways, this was a rah-rah rat. In the main challenge, I was like, Chugga chugga choo choo. She's on the love train, mama. The dancing was there. It was present. It was amazing. I think maybe the only thing that held her back was her partner, Simone, which we'll get to in a second. And then the boots, mama, the boots. Like, yeah, the dancing was great, but the boots were so bad that I have to give it a rat. Next up, phrase, pride, respect, Simone. Ugh. Ugh. I'm fine, I'm sorry, I was just gagging on the Alaganza. She's doing one of the looks from RuPaul's Back to My Roots music video, and it is so perfectly done. It's an excellent reference. Notice here, Simone doesn't have to rely on like three different colors to let you know that it is Simone Couture. Like this is the type of shit I see and I'm like, I wanna get inside her brain. One of my favorite details on this is that when she turns around, you can see the little G string with the circle in the middle, tying together the front of the outfit with also that giant circle in the hair. It's just, immaculate. And I think actually the lighting of that RuPaul's Drag Race stage may have robbed you of seeing how amazing her look actually is because the dress is all black. You can hardly even tell that it's just completely made of hair braids. I want to see Simone walk every single runway around the world and back again. This look is pressed, curled, and hot. 
And honestly, her look is maybe what saved her from being bottom three. I definitely don't think she deserved a lip sync for her life or anything like that, but it was definitely a weak performance of the cast. It was a prize. Now let's talk a little bit about that bottom two and that lip sync. Was the outcome of the lip sync correct? I do think so. However, I don't think the bottom two was the right bottom two. It should have been Gottmik versus Candy. That's my thoughts on that. Let me know what y'all thought down in the comments below. This week on the runway, my hottest hat goes to Simone. I also asked my patrons over on patreon.com to vote for their hottest hot, and this week they've chosen Gottmik. I'll see y'all next week. Love ya. Bye. Hi, Ugly. It's me, Bussy. And welcome back to Hot or Rat. And today we'll be reviewing the Beat It runway from RuPaul's Drag Race season 13. Before we get started, I want to remind you to click like if you have a need for beads and to press subscribe if you support my journey. I also want to remind you that my channel is made possible by my generous patrons over on patreon.com slash bussyqueen. That's my members only website for patrons who get access to exclusive content like lip sync reaction videos for every episode of RuPaul's Drag Race that I review, access to the Bussy Queen Discord, access to hottest polls and more. For just a couple of dollars a month, my patrons get all those amazing benefits plus the satisfaction of knowing they helped me afford studio equipment, rent, and food. So what are you waiting for? Click the link in the description of this video to join my Patreon today at patreon.com slash bussyqueen. Now let's beat it together. First up is Denali. This was a full stop gag. Denali, oh. She did not come to play. She's giving me a Sia swing from the chandelier moment, living her best life on the runway. Imagine you walk into your rich friend's house and you see Denali hanging from the ceiling in this outfit. <laughs> She's just like, hey y'all, do y'all want me to turn the light on up here? <laughs> And the whole look is very Beauty and the Beast character come to life. You know, all those little inanimate objects were like talking and singing and dancing. That is exactly what I'm seeing from Zanali here. She also said one of maybe the weirdest things that we've heard come out of RuPaul's Drag Race contestant's mouth. She's been obsessed with lamps ever since she was a little boy. <laughs> Denali's a quirky little kid, and I love that about her. And you better watch out, because the bulbs on this chandelier are hot. Next up, if you can't beat her, join her. It's Rose. This look was very cute. It was reminding me a lot of that, like, paper doll cutout thing that Milk did on All Stars 3. It, the shape of it looks 2D. It's crazy. But then when she starts turning, you see that, oh, there's these, like, little fun divots on the skirt moment. And the beads almost are like those plastic beads that you melt into a pattern. Did y'all ever have those as kids? I love how bright and fun this look is. The only thing that really didn't wow me about it was, I guess, the lack of beads in the hair or maybe just what she's wearing in the hair in general. But that's a small complaint because the silhouette is so freaking gorgeous. This one is right up there next to that crazy lampshade chandelier thing that she did back in the fashion show early in this season. Rose really popped off tonight. This look is Next up, I wonder what she had to do to get that many beads. It's La La Ree. So this one I wanted so much to love, but I just didn't. The pieces, I think, individually were so great. The way the pieces moved on her body when she was on the runway and in the lip sync later, so gorgeous. But the problem was when you line this up to what everyone else did on the runway, it just almost doesn't feel finished. Like it just kind of felt almost like she started getting dressed and then stopped halfway through. I think maybe if this had gone more of the carnival route, like had she had a big giant headpiece and some wings or something really like huge behind her, a big bustle, something to really, really give it that va va voom. This could have been really, really good. But this look tonight, compared with everyone else, just feels more like the meet and greet outfit that you put on after the main show. So for that reason, I am going to give this look a rot. Next up, she's coming in from behind. <gasps> it's comic. Okay. <laughs> Who does this? Only got Mick. This is so iconic. I do want to point out this ball hat thing that she's wearing is not necessarily new in the drag world or the club kid world, which you may know if you've followed certain artists like Imp Kid or I mean, hey, if you've watched earlier seasons of Drag Race, you know, Latrice has worn a similar type of thing on the runway. But Gottmik took that and very much made it her own. She put that wild little beaded head thing with a 60s mod dress adorned with tons more certain types of special beads. My personal favorite types of beads. Bussy beads. Oh my God, they're bussy beads. Of course, just brilliant. The girls are girling. She's got pain and she's got pleasure. This look is hot. Next up, what Candy Muse thought she looked like at the back. 
It's Olivia Lux. So yes, she is wearing a wig very similar to the one that Candy wore. They just both had no idea that they were both going to be doing something like that. And it's really unfortunate for Olivia that she is once again, the second one <laughs> to wear the look that she brought. Poor Olivia, she just can't win. That's sad. Is this really beaded? The little like hairband things, like I'm not sure that I would call those beads. I, I don't know what to call them. There are some beads throughout the look, but I guess I'm not totally sure why this was the concept she went with when clearly there was just so much that you could do with this. But I like that it was a fresh take and definitely different amongst the cast tonight. I wanna see them dripping, opulent soaking, rolling in the beads. But this one just isn't really doing all that for me. But it is cute. So I think I'm gonna leave this one at a warming up. Cause it's not bad. It's just not my favorite. Next up, my bloody Valentine. It's Utica. This is jaw dropping. This is art. This is opulent Renaissance Shakespeare adorned with pearlescent beads, dripping in pearl necklaces. Oh my God. She says that she has murdered her husband and she's just walking through his blood. Or maybe it's the blood of all the oysters that had to die for those pearls on her neck. Utica is just giving me deconstructed murder mystery bride left at the altar realness. They say all you beat in life is love, but I guess a life insurance check would do too. This look is hot. Next up, stop the mother tucking press. Candy Muse, drop dead gorgeous tonight. Oh my God. And you know she felt it too. Oh. The outfit overall is giving me like a Kung Lao meets Beyonce kind of fantasy, which are really just two references I never thought that I would put together, but I love, love what she did. I love the nipple tassels. I love the nude fur coat. The color palette of it all is just so tasty. It's very also kind of Kim Kardashian. Like she would definitely wear this to the Met Gala or something in the future. Yeah, this look was a total fatality. It's hot. Next up, let's take a trip to the bead factory and talk to the manager named Deborah. <laughs> Simone is so great. She is so funny. I love her to death. This runway also is phenomenal. She says she's giving us Glamazonian Zulu African warrior and I am gagging for this. The color palette is, is very earthy, very natural. She's got Simone in the beads on the braids of her hair. I mean, come on. I did see some chatter online about, oh, wah, wah, like how many times are we gonna see her oiled up body on the runway? And I'm like, girl, you should be happy that you can see her oiled up body on the runway. Runway. I think some people are maybe thinking, oh, why isn't Simone getting critiqued for kind of relying on that body as judges like Michelle used to critique queens for. And I think the reason is because she uses her body not as the primary accessory of a look, but something that is always present and there once you look behind the beautiful avant-garde fashion that she walks the runway with. And like, I don't even wanna know how long this look took to make or how heavy that hair is. But mama, the bead factory must be out of stock after making this outfit. That look is so, so hot. Next up, Tina Beater. This is how I feel about this look. This is just... <laughs> It's not good, it's not good. I feel so bad for Tina because I feel like she has so many great ideas, but rarely do they come to fruition on the runway. And the crazy thing is, I've never seen somebody do reveals in such a way consistently that make me wish there wasn't reveals. <laughs> Like, I just really felt for her as she's like taking pieces of this outfit off, like her beaded cone Madonna boots, and they just like clamor to the floor. And I'm like, oh, like, oh. Oh God, that comes off. Oh, ouch. It's like, no mama, that should have stayed on. Keep it on. This is uh, the nightmare realm of the world that Utica lives in. <laughs> They both had that little Shakespearean collar thing on, but y'all let me know down in the comments who you think wore it better. Just kidding, we don't condone bullying here. It's a rat. Rat, 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 rat. rat. Next up, is it called Queen Cake if a drag queen made it? It's Elias with two T's. This was a really good runway for her. She is always going back to the 80s for her looks. And I was so happy to see that she went even further back for this one, back to the 20s. But she also kind of made it modern and fresh because she took the 20s flapper dress and brought it to New Orleans. This is the type of thing that I wish she would do more of with her 80s fashion that sometimes is really good, but sometimes it's just kind of dated feeling for me. Like I want her to take that time period and keep pushing, keep bringing it forward, right? Let's not, let's not stay back there. Cause I think it's fun to reference time periods, but not so much fun to live in them. I like beads and I cannot lie. This look is hot. And the winner of this episode is Olivia Lux. And in our bottom two are Elliot and Lala Ree. As for my hottest hot 
it. Is it okay with y'all if I break the rules just this once? I think I have to say my hottest hot of this runway is a tie between Denali and Simone. I did make my patrons choose, however, and they voted for Simone. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see y'all next time. Love ya. Bye. Hi, uglies. Hi, hotties. It's me, Bussy, and welcome back to or rat. And today we'll be reviewing episode 8 of RuPaul's Drag Race season 13. It's Rusical time! A challenge I would never succeed at. And on the main stage, the runway category was yellow, gorgeous. Before we get started, I want to remind you to press like if you're happy to see me in drag again and to press subscribe if you enjoy food. Now, let's pissy that walk. First up, Tina, bring me the cab! <laughs> It's Tina Burner. She is giving us a taxi cab fantasy, maybe more of like an old school taxi cab. I just know that when Tina saw the category yellow, she about pissed herself because that's one of her three colors. She literally could have worn anything in her wardrobe and it would have made sense for this runway. It's cool. The only thing I really don't like about this look are the headlights on her headlights. I think they're just a tad gauche. They're like those push lamp things that you put by your nightstand or something. I did like though that she had had the burner plates on her bumper. That was very cute. The only thing overall that the outfit was kind of missing for me was that forward thinkingness, right? It seems like Tina is just kind of stuck doing her one sticky campy thing on the runway, which most of the time isn't bad, but I just kind of want to see her really, really step outside of her lane and try something new, you know? That said, we can't get too mad at a gal that's been around town a couple of times. That's why they call her taxi. <gasps> this look is hot. In the Rusical, I thought that she did really well in her leading role. I thought she gave a really consistent performance. I mean, she really didn't mess up at all. They seemed to be kind of mad at the fact that she didn't make any noise when she died, <laughs> which was also funny because Anne Hathaway specifically told Tina, make as much noise as you can before you die. And then she doesn't. But I, I didn't really see bottom three for Miss Tina Burner in the Rusical. In fact, if I came across her personal data, I might just keep it. I think her performance was hot. Next up, she'll take her ostrich eggs sunny side up and a bit runny, and she'll keep the ostrich feathers on her arms as pageant feather cuffs. Firstly, it goes without saying, she looks f***ing <gasps> gorgeous. She always does, but I kind of feel like we're getting to a place with Olivia where it's like, yeah, we, we know you are gorgeous. We know you're pretty but can you give us something more? Can you elevate it to the next level? And although it wasn't the most unique thing we've ever seen, I mean, hell, she beat every single one of those other bitches in the beauty category tonight. This look was hot. But let's talk about that rusical. I was so surprised they let her get away with wearing like a tank top, a gray tank top at that, jeans and some sneaker heels. Why did they let things like that slide here in Drag Race US? But over on Drag Race UK, they're reading girls to fill for wearing H&M. Make it make sense. Regarding her actual performance though, it was a very safe choice. She smiles and she lights up the whole stage. You don't want her to stop singing. You don't want her to stop performing. Was it a standout of the night for me? Not necessarily, but really good nonetheless. This performance was indeed hot. Next up, suspender, I hardly, just kidding. Simone on the runway tonight, oh my god, as always, looks fabulous. She's wearing the high fashion streetwear Versace collection from New York City itself, but in space. I think a really high point of her outfit and look in general is that hair, oh my god. There is just something about Simone's hair every single time. It, it looks so real. You zoom in on that lace and like, you're like, okay, that's like parted and shit. Like you can see her scalp, Simone. Chef's kiss. This is like that Y2K rave girl, but all grown up and I guess inherited millions of dollars. She looks fabulous, fun, flirty, 30, thriving. And she had me at yellow. This look is hot. <laughs> However, her performance in the Rue School was not a ray of light. Girl, she sent me a friend request, I would hit that block, block, block button. I don't know what happened. It was like she was the physical performance embodiment of please don't look at me with those sunglasses. She was like literally trying to hide in the background. She was Damien in Mean Girls at the girl's little apology circle moment, pretending that she wasn't there. Anyways, this performance was a Next up, she's six seasons too late to the Shakespeare challenge. It's 
Utica. I love that all of Utica's looks are unique, custom Utica couture, if you will, because you kind of start to see these patterns where she is tying together certain looks. Her promo yarn ball look is immediately what my mind went to when I saw this. You just saw it and you're just like, yeah, mm -hmm, Utica made that, it's her. It has her stamp on it, I love that. She's got those little, you know, medieval renaissance space buns that the girls were wearing back in with the little beaded napkins in there as well. Smart details very of the era. The only critique that I have for it is I wish there was a little more fabric on the middle part of that sideless gown. It's just a little too thin there and, and the yellow like zoot suit underneath it is kind of like sticking out a bit too much for me, if you know what I mean? But honey, that's a small, small critique. I mean, if you tried to look this good on the runway, you'd go Baroque trying. <laughs> Her look was in the musical. She did great. She got the edit in this episode where it was like, oh, she's gonna flop, she's gonna fail, she's fumbling and tumbling all over her lyrics. But then when it came time to shine, she hit every single one of those lyrics on beat and with like gumption. She really did that. I actually was confused that she wasn't in the top three. I think she deserved it. I don't know. They kind of overlooked her maybe in favor of the little Russian duo, which I'll talk about here in just a second. But Utica? Well, I super liked her performance. It was hot. Hold up. Are you thirsty? It's Candy Muse, and she's brought the lemonade to the runway. Candy, you look tucking gorgeous on the runway. Seriously, this was a really shining moment for you. I love that she did the Beyonce lemonade reference, but very much made it her own. She put all the sunflowers in the hair to really make everything pop and tie everything together. If I was gonna change something small, probably would have got rid of the necklace. That didn't make a lot of sense for me. And I was looking for her bat, because Reddit said she had a pretty big one, but I didn't see it. Anyways, yellow, but make it hoe. This look was in the musical, It was a floppity floppity, flippity floppity, fishity floppity mama, wasn't it? There was like a surprising amount of auto-tune added to her voice. I don't know if that was like intentional to make her sound bad or it was just part of her character. I don't know. She didn't really do a lot for me on the main stage tonight. It was definitely a bottom two performance for me and I'm swiping left. It was a whack. Next up, she's waiting outside, but not for more than one minute. If you don't make it out there and get in there right now, she's going to drive away and charge you for the ride anyways. It's Elliot with two T's overall. I think this was a really solid take on Taxi. My critiques here though are like, how many times are we gonna see that shoulder pad silhouette on her on the runway? It's like every single time. I'm like, girl, give me something new. I'm tired, tired of the overblown 80 shoulder pad thing. Let's move on. That said, considered on its own, absent of the knowledge of what she's done on the runway for all of the past episodes, I think she looks great. It was a much more fresher and fashion forward way to do a take on Taxi than like, let's say Tina did. I like what Elliot Elliot did here. This look was hot with two T's. But I do have a question for you. Of our two taxi cabbies tonight, who wore it better? Let me know down in the comments below. Next up, did you miss me? <laughs> it's Rose. She is doing a The Mask reference. This was uh, one of my favorite movies as a kid, but it was also one of those movies that I think was mm, a little bit ahead of its time and so bizarre and surreal. It kind of almost just fades into a fever dream in your mind. But as much as I love, <gasps> that movie. I do not like Rose's interpretation. Honestly, I don't think the face was green enough. I think if we are going to do the mask, mama, I want to see some prosthetics. You can't be in less drag than the actual character from the movie. I also didn't like that she wore hair with this. I think doing it bald with the hat would have been much more appropriate. Like if we're going to do a reference, let's just do the fucking <gasps> reference, you know, make it your own then. But I don't think toning it down for a Jim Carrey character, that wasn't the right choice. On top of the fact, of course, that the outfit is orange. <laughs> Girl, Miss Rose needs to put a mask on it and cover it up. This was a rat. But in the rusical, this was her moment. I have never felt more proud of a contestant on RuPaul's Drag Race. I'm dead serious. Like, I finally fell in love with Rose, and it just had to see her sing like she was on Broadway. And that bitch can belt it, my God. I also loved seeing her win this challenge because I know Jan was sitting at home, like, foaming at the mouth. <laughs> Rosé, Rosé. This performance was hot. Next up, y'all, we've got a trending hashtag and it is Medusa. It's Denali. Seriously though, what, what's going on with the Medusa thing? Like we just saw on Drag Race Holland, Room's alternate first look that she wanted to do as Medusa. And then we just saw Veronica Green do it on Drag Race UK. Oh, someone else on Drag Race UK did Medusa on that same runway. And now here we are with Miss Denali doing it. I smell a cons 
conspiracy theory that said for as much as I've seen Medusa done, Denali did it different. She did Medusa if she was a boa constrictor. Specifically, the boa constrictor from the Britney Spears performance. You know the one. By the way, hashtag free Britney. This was everything. This gave me life. I'm like, why don't you come around and <laughs> choke me sometime? <laughs> this look is <laughs> in the musical. I was really happy that Rose got her time to shine, but girl Denali could have had that win too. I mean, if she had the leading role, uh, it was hers to take. You know, she was a little bit held back by her role, the little Russian twin bot thing with Gottmik. I think of the two, Denali did it better. Jamal said it best to Gottmik when he was critiquing her. He basically said, you kept up with Denali. <laughs> That kind of back can kind of compliment. That is the drag race shade that I live for. Denali, she killed it. I'm putting her in the <laughs> category tonight. Next up, it's got five star crash ratings. Mick, y'all, is this the season of <laughs> accidentally reusing runways or what? Like the number of times that we've seen this accidentally happen on the runway, Olivia doing Simone's boxer look, the two taxi looks on the runway tonight, and now the crash dummy that we've seen Denali do already back in the ball. That said, that doesn't mean this look wasn't sickening as hell. I lived for it. It was giving me like yellow toxic plasma demon crash dummy. I also thought it was super fun that the whole thing is also very um, cyberpunk, kind of matrix but make it crash dummy. I don't know, it's really great. She really is crashing the system. This look is in the rusical, however. So I gotta call shade. I gotta call it. We know Gottmik is not a dancer, okay? We saw, what, two, three episodes ago? She, they hid her whole entire performance with Tina Ferner's amazingness. And then I think it's no coincidence that in the rusical, she got a part with choreography that she could kind of flub and have a little free form rock and roll moment. You know, just, it was more about making it cool than actually following specific steps and doing things according to certain timing. Hmm, girl, I'm not saying they're playing favorites, but they might be playing favorites. Regardless, Gottmik did amazing tonight. But I think for me, this performance was more of a safe than a top three. But the performance was hot. So, Rose takes the win, and in our bottom two are Simone and Candy Muse. I think all of that was so right. This was one of those episodes where you just totally agreed kind of with everything that's happening. Or maybe you didn't, and that's fine too. Let me know what you were thinking down in the comments below. But that lip sync, wow. I was shook. They had me, mama. They got me, gal. Concerning the outcome, I love that it was a double save, but I actually kind of thought Candy won that lip sync. Something about her energy there was just a little more amped up than Simone's. And y'all know, y'all know I love Simone. I would give her the crowd right now if I could just based on her runways, but Candy did it for me tonight. As for my hottest hot on the runway, tonight it goes to Denali. I also asked my patrons to vote for their hottest hot, and this week they've chosen Comic. Thanks for watching, and I'll see y'all next week. Love ya. Bye. Hi, ugly. It's me, Bussy, and welcome back to Hot or Rat. And today we'll be reviewing episode 9 of RuPaul's Drag Race season 13. I'll be breaking down each of our Queen Snatch Game performances and fascinating fascinator runways for you. But first, I want to remind you to click like if you love Snatch Games, to press subscribe if you think that's a hot. And I'd also like to say thanks to my generous patrons who support my channel over on patreon.com slash bussyqueen and get exclusive member benefits like early access to my videos, exclusive lip sync reaction videos every single week, their names in the credits of my videos and personal shout outs, access to the Bussy Queen Discord server, and more. For just a few dollars a month, they get all those benefits and the satisfaction of sleeping better at night knowing that they've supported an independent creator. So don't wait any longer. Click the link in the description of this this video to join my Patreon at patreon.com slash bussyqueen. See you there. Now, let's stack those M's. First up, she's experimenting on the runway tonight. It's Olivia Lux. She's giving us a mad scientist fantasy. I could not help but wonder if this was inspired by Dexter's laboratory. She has the orange hair, of course the white coat, but then the blue gloves. I don't know, it seems possible. I love this look so much because this is exactly what I wanted from our dear, sweet, beautiful, amazingly talented Olivia to go a little bit outside of her box, give us a full concept and make me gag a little bit. Her fascinator is super creative. It's a splash of metal mercury. I love it. And I have a hypothesis that this look may have saved her from the bottom tonight. Her fascinator may be in retrograde, but this look is the future. It's hot. 
not. However, in the Snatch Game, she failed to influence me. She was doing this chef influencer, Tap of the Brown, who I was completely unfamiliar with. So I thought maybe we could do a little bit of exploring together. I'm going through Tap of this Instagram right now and I'm seeing the look absolutely spot on from Olivia's standpoint. Her food looks interesting and she's a very charismatic, full of joy type of person, but she's definitely not a comedian from what I can see. But regardless of who Tabitha Brown is, Olivia did not make her funny. And you don't really need to do a funny person to be funny in Snatch Game. I mean, Gigi did Maria the Robot last season and won. It's really just about, can you make RuPaul laugh or at least smile? <laughs> and she didn't do either of those things tonight. Olivia's vegetables were from start to finish. Next up, my God, I can see her rosebud from here. She really should get that checked. It's Rosé. So tonight, Rosé is the most on the nose that she has ever been. <laughs> She's combined her love of pink, which we have seen her in many times throughout this season, with her love of ruffles, and then doing a play on the pronunciation of her name, Rosé, as Rose. All the other times that she has tried to incorporate ruffles in her looks, or do something with this type of fabric, she's ended up looking a bit dated, but this garment really takes Rosé into a new direction. She looks fashionable, fresh, punny. It's very smart. There's a lot of really nice attention to detail here. There's some studs on her belt and on her gloves, which are, of course, resembling thorns from her being a giant rose. And I think it really was those little moments where she let our eyes have a break on the asymmetrical sleeve that allowed us to have a moment with this garment on the runway. Rosé was in full bloom tonight. This look is hot. But does a rosé by the name of Mary Queen Scots smell as sweet? Turns out it does. Fun fact, when I was investigating this figure, I found out that she became queen when she was just six days old. Really brings a whole new meaning to the phrase baby queen, right? I actually thought rosé was a real contender to win this episode. She did one of those that was bizarre, not from this time period, and just... Totally out of left field, but that's why it worked. It was reminiscent of Jinx Monsoon's Little Edie or Bendilla Crim's Maggie Smith. And I think her laying on that really thick Scottish accent is what really sold it to me. Also another fun fact, if you were curious why her eyelashes were painted white for this, royalty of the older times used to pluck out their lashes, get rid of their eyebrows, and even move their natural hairlines back because that was like somehow what they considered beautiful. Go figure. Anyways, great Scott. This performance was Next up, a tisket, a tasket. Utica brought a basket on her head. She's giving me crazy cat lady in her younger years, working at Vogue, throwing a picnic on her lunch break for all of her imaginary friends' realness. The main part of this outfit is made to look like the blanket that you would throw down and have the picnic on. And then she's got the details of like ants crawling up her legs, bees, she says flying out of her basket, even though I think they looked a little bit more like butterflies. And overall just looks so editorial. It's a really well-constructed garment that is fresh, funny, campy, and exciting. This is the reason that we love Utica. This look is the bee's knees. It's hot. However, tonight Utica's runway was a work of art, but her snatch game was a cheap imitation of Bob Ross. Actually, it really didn't imitate much. It was pretty fucking weird. First, I do wanna talk about the fashion of this look. Instead of wearing curly hair because she thought that would be cultural appropriation, she chose to make a headpiece out of squirrels. That was kooky crazy. And again, why we love Utica. I think there probably is a lot of potential here to take this iconic character and make him funny, but Utica missed every single opportunity she could have taken. And even did really weird things like the spray paint on her little index card. And I think that was like a last ditch effort to do something crazy and unexpected, kind of like how Katya ate hers when she was doing Bjork. Anyways, Utica's paint tonight was expired. This was a rat. Next up, girl, I'm not even gonna make a pun here because I don't want to take away from the seriousness and amazingness of this look. It's Simone. She is wearing this almost nun-esque outfit, it appears at first. It reminded me very much of Gaga in 2013 at the VMAs. This look is stunning by itself. And then she reveals she is a black angelic being. And then she turns around and her fascinator says, say their names. And she's got two rhinestoned bullet holes in her back. Like my jaw was just dropped on the floor, gagged that she did this on national TV on RuPaul's Drag Race. I was like, oh, she 
is a queen. She really did that. In her confessional, they overlaid on her runway. She is saying their names too. Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Brilla Stone, Trayvon Martin, Tony McCade, Nina Pop, and Monica Diamond. The phrase say their names is of course from the Black Lives Matter movement that has been occurring in the United States, waking a lot of people up and helping everyone to realize that there is way too much police violence and black people are dying at the hands of this police violence and we cannot, as a society, let that keep happening. This runway raises awareness to the cause, says their names, and reminds us all what we have been through as a country in the past year. This look is hot, and the message makes it unforgettable. And in the Snatch Game, you think she was walking around with a shiny dress and a crown on her head when she was taking slaves? To freedom! To freedom! That was for my barbs. In Snatch Game, Simone did Harriet Tubman, which was bold, but also I think a great pairing to her runway. And it was an amazing way to connect two different time periods with similar causes. Harriet Tubman, if you're unfamiliar, is a famous abolitionist from the United States who freed slaves during the Civil War era through a network of anti-slavery activists termed the Underground Railroad. The even crazier thing is that she herself was born into slavery. So I think this was an excellent opportunity to to bring a little history lesson to those who may be unaware of who she is and do it in a really tasteful way because she somehow did make Harriet Tubman funny without laughing at her. It could have gone south real quick, but Simone was quick-witted, knowledgeable, well, you know, except for about Jennifer Lewis. <laughs> and managed to make an important American cultural icon funny. This Snatch Game was hot. Next up, oh my God, how's her head? It's coming. I don't know about y'all, but this punk runway spoke to me in ways that runways have not spoken to me in many episodes. Her fascinator is a giant paper clip sticking through her head with a drop of rhinestone blood coming off the end. She managed to do something fashionable, underground, anarchist, and punk all in one. It's so great. I love the detail of the little gender symbol on the bottom of this coat. I mean, the whole thing is just got me from head to toe. This look raged against the machine. It's hot. And Forgot my Snatch Game? Well, girl, I was sliving for it. She did Paris Hilton, who hasn't been done since Raven originally did her in her season. And no major shade to Raven, but Got Mick did it about a thousand times better. This Paris Hilton will go down in her story forever. Side note, I did recently watch Paris Hilton's documentary. I highly recommend it. It really shed a lot of light on how cruelly she was treated by the American media when she was telling her story and when those tapes leaked. And it was such a shame because she actually is a very intelligent, businesswoman and she has kind of tricked so many people into believing that she's just some dumb blonde airhead. Which like, if you thought women couldn't do drag, look no further than Paris Hilton. Anyways, Gottmik had the voice, the attitude, the characterizations down to a T. Her Paris Hilton, that's hot. Next up, Roller Girl, I hardly know the girl. <laughs> It's Denali. She says she's giving us vintage diner girl realness, which she is. But <laughs> like this outfit was so lackluster for drag race. Like girl, can we put one rhinestone on it? Maybe on the apron, on the collar, on the tights, somewhere, just one little tiny sparkle. But instead, it literally was just like Halloween costume cut thing as Michelle brought up with admittedly a very cool fascinator on the top of her head. It was reminiscent of the blood bucket one that Raja did for her Carrie look back on her season. Whether it was intentional or not, I really appreciate that nod to drag fashion of the yesteryears. And, you know, she is roller skating on the runway. Season 8 is quaking. <laughs> Like, we have to give her credit for those two things at least. But overall, the look is a rat. But in the Snatch Game, oh my god, she was totally gorge. Her JVN was unexpected, fresh, fun, JVN to a T. I think Denali deserves extra props here because JVN's character is so eccentric, so out there and bubbly and wild, it would have been so easy for it to appear that she was just making fun of him. But instead of laughing at him, she was laughing with him. Very, you know, in on the joke and appreciated of who he is and what he does, which I think takes a special kind of comedy genius to do. She, I think, actually was so good. She could have shared this win with Gottmik and I would not have been mad at all. This performance was hot. Next up, it's Elliot with two T's and one leg tonight. <laughs> 
I was so glad that Michelle explained what the hell was going on here because I didn't get it. So the frumpy frilly leg moment is actually supposed to be the lack of leg, which is, I guess, matched by the arm on the top as well, because she's got flamingo feathers in her hair and she's, she's a flamingo. They stand on one leg. I feel like if she had literally left the fabric on the leg in that arm off and it had just been her skin, this look could have been a thousand times better. And I do think she needed to fix the hair on this. A little pussycat probably would have been a lot better or something off this shoulder because the texture of that bodysuit was so intense and detailed that having all that frizzy hair mixed in with it really just kind of washed everything out and looked strange. And we've also already seen a bird done really well this season. Denali. And unfortunately, Elliot's bird just didn't leave me squawking for more. This look was a magrat. And in Snatch Game, she did Rue. No, the other Rue. McClanahan from Golden Girls. Okay, so I have a confession. I've never seen Golden Girls. Crucify me now in the comment section below if you have to, but I don't know. I just was never around it and never felt inspired to turn it on. I have seen Mean Girls though. I imagine they're similar, right? Anyways, yeah, this was another tab of the brown moment. It was like, it doesn't matter if the audience doesn't know who the person is. What matters is, is the person in the Snatch Game telling jokes. <laughs> and Elliot told not one joke. She just kind of kept repeating that she liked men and gentlemen. There was just no substance behind her choice of character. It also doesn't help that Rue had extremely high expectations for Elliot choosing this person because it's Rue's favorite show. Anyways, yeah, this was a straight up rot. Saddle up, we're off to the races. Cases of Bacardi chasers. It's Tina Burner. Remember Violet Tchotchke's jockey look? Well, this is her now. <laughs> Girl, Tina. She is beating a dead horse with how bad her runways have been this season, my God. And it's like such a shame because I really think she has good ideas, but the way that the garments are made, they come off almost too campy. It's like, yeah, we get it, you're a horse, you've got the roses around your neck, you've got the giant blue ribbon, but you've got a horse on your head too? Let's just bring that back one or two steps and make the garment fit better. And that little horse fascinator on her head is the saddest little sea biscuit I ever have seen. She looks like a potato. <laughs> But hey, at least she's a potato on Drag Race. I'm just a potato sitting in my bedroom. Anyways, this look finished last tonight. It's a rat. But her Snatch Game really worked out. She did Richard Simmons, an eccentric workout video personality type of guy from the 80s. She did well. I think the look and the characterizations were all there. Was it LOL, Raffle Copter, LMAO? Maybe not, but it did make me crack a smile or two. I think her Snatch Game was just enough to break a sweat. A small sweat though. And finally, are you amused yet? It's Candy Muse. Candy tonight on the runway is giving us peplum, but make it a whole dress <laughs> in a houndstooth fabric. It's kind of reminiscent of like what a clown would wear, I guess. Oh my God, clown's tooth, anyone? <laughs> And then her fascinator is her last name spelled out on top of her head. But why? How do the feathers link or match up to this outfit she's wearing? And what is the bigger message here? I, I think that's where I really got stuck. Like what is the concept you were going for and how did we arrive here? I do definitely have to give her props for her makeup and overall serve on the runway. Like I think she looks really confident and dare I say a bit fashionable, but I just kept looking for a through line and got lost in the patterns. It just left me confused. I'm gonna go ahead and give this a rot. In the Snatch Game though, she was a star. Patrick Star, or at least an asteroid. <laughs> Patrick Starr is a YouTuber beauty influencer who rose to fame several years ago, kind of peaked back in 2018, I would say, but a well-known name nonetheless. She has on the iconic Patrick Starr head wrap, definitely has the look down overall, but was it really Patrick Starr or was it Candy Muse dressed up in a Patrick Starr costume? <laughs> I'm not sure any of the jokes really landed from the perspective of Patrick. It really just felt like Candy was being a ham up there. I think it's also important to note, we really didn't see much of Candy in the Snatch game. I think the editors and producers maybe tactfully hit her and showed us her best moments to really justify a safe placement, which again, I laughed and I thought she was great. I'm going to give her performance a but I think it's just, you know, a little mysterious. Like where was the rest of what she was doing in Snatch Game? I would like to see it. So Gomic does take the win this episode. Really wouldn't have been mad about a double or God, even triple win. It actually was a phenomenal Snatch Game. The good performances were great. And luckily the majority were 
great. The bottom three though, mama, they were a bottom three through and through. Elliot and Utica do end up lip syncing tonight and our little birdie Elliot ends up flying home tonight. My hottest hot on the runway tonight goes to Simone. I also ask my patrons every single week to vote for their hottest hot and this week they've also chosen Simone. Let me know what y'all thought about this episode down in the comments below where the placement's correct. Do you think Elliot should have gone home and do you think Got Make deserved the win by themselves? Thanks so much for watching and I'll see y'all next time. Love ya, bye. It's me, Bussy, and welcome back to Hot or Rat. And today we'll be reviewing episode 10 of RuPaul's Drag Race season 13. Our queens were paired off by a sidekick and then challenged to turn their partners into their doppelgangers. Doppelganger? I hardly know her! <laughs> Bet you didn't see that coming. I'll be evaluating these runways based on whether I like them or not and whether I think the transformation was a total lookalike or a cheap phony. Before we get started, I want to remind you to press like if you stand Lindsay Lohan's Freaky Friday era and to press subscribe for good fortune. Now, let's look into our crystal balls. First up, Rosé, bring me the pies out of the oven. It's Rosé as Dina Burner, and she is serving me a nuclear family fantasy. <laughs> This is something from Tina's closet, so you know it has those campy details hidden all over it. She, of course, has the name Tina Burner on the apron. And then the pies, which are referencing the 60s housewife pie thing, are actually on the dress, but as pie charts. Though it's a shame all the financial modeling in the world couldn't have made this look any less cheap. But don't worry, this outfit does have a reveal because it is a Tina look, and every Tina look has to have a reveal, God damn it. She takes off the pie dress to reveal a leopard bodysuit. I guess meant to look like sexy lingerie. This housewife has a surprise for her husband when he comes home from a hard day of work. The makeup on Rose's face, terrible. <laughs> Literally a hate crime, but undeniably Tina. And the outfit, atrocious overall. This pie is a rot from first bite to last. But my God, the transformation was amazing. This was one of the funniest <gasps> runways I've ever seen. The stomping, the overzealous, large, creepy smile. The little stiff doll movements that she does on the runway. Rose had Tina Burner's characterizations down. Overall, I think Rose really turned and burned this challenge. This transformation was hot. And honestly, can I tell you a little secret? I am starting to kind of really, really love and appreciate Tina's runways. Like, they are so comically bad consistently that we are verging into so bad that it's good territory and i just wish she was in on the joke but that could also just be the stockholm syndrome talking zip up it's tina speaking of bad looks i saw this dress and seriously questioned whether they were intentionally trying to sabotage each other on the runway tonight like girl glitter polka dots tie dye and white and black color blocking with sleeves full of zip ties what in god's name was this at least she's prepared for anything except the runway <laughs> I actually was a little bit surprised not to see something covered in tulle and ruffles being a rosé look, but you could tell it was from rosé's closet nonetheless. I'm just glad that we saw this look on Tina and not rosé, and now she can officially burner it. This look was a rat. But again, this duo with the characterizations and the makeup, they totally nailed it. This is maybe the most beautiful that we have seen Tina's face look throughout the entire competition. I really, really love seeing that higher arched brow on Tina's face. I think that's something she needs to incorporate into her regular makeup. And, you know, she had the classic rosé big pink hair. I mean, this was rosé on the runway. Both Tina and rosé were so over the top that it kind of felt like a competition they were in to out camp and out parody each other, which was why they, I think, were actually my favorite pair to watch on the runway tonight. Like, girl, this is what drag is about. Give me the camp. Give me the comp. Comedy. Make me laugh. Cheers to Tina. This transformation was hot. Next up, it's a bird. It's a plane. No, it's Olivia Lux. This look is giving me Elsa got stuck in a giant shower loofah realness. It's not my favorite outfit that I've seen from Denali's closet, but it does very much read Denali. In fact, it's almost identical to the first runway that she wore in the competition. She had the same braid on, and instead of cloudy, puffy tulle, she used feathers. You also knew this was a Denali look because of the danceability built into the garment. It was fun, but at the same time, you knew that she could bust a move if she needed to. 
So it was no surprise that Olivia did super well in the lip sync when, you know, Denali was trapped in a gown. Because this look was going for Ice Princess, I think maybe it would have looked a little bit better with a slimmer silhouette or maybe a more expensive fabric or maybe some kind of gag. I don't know. It was just a little bit shapeless and I kind of lost our little ray of sunshine behind all of the puffs of tulle. The look itself, I'm going to go ahead and give a rat. But the transformation, I actually very much disagree with the judges. I got Denali through and through. She had the like kind of serve face that Denali does. She slapped her ass on the runway. It, it was very different for Olivia. And the makeup was undeniably Denali's. I mean, she had that really curvy arched brow, the blue eyeshadow. I, I didn't understand what the judges didn't see. Olivia even pretended to skate on the runway. I think she did really well. For me, the transformation was <sighs> enough to melt ice. Next up, stole my wig. It's Denali as Olivia Lux. This was really tough for me because I think we have to recognize that Denali looks the most gorgeous that we have seen her on the runway throughout the entire season. She is giving me old Hollywood glamour, but with a modern twist in that orange hair. This look is opulent, expensive, glamazon, and that is what Rue is always looking for, right? The look itself was hot. But the transformation, what the challenge was really about tonight, was totally lacking. However, I don't think that's really Denali's fault. She was paired with somebody who is ultimately kind of still a baby queen and I think hasn't yet fully developed her brand and vision for who she is as a performer. For example, Denali is our ice princess. Rosé loves Tool. Gottmik is punk and Tina's runways are terrible. <laughs> Like the things I would maybe think they would incorporate under the runway for this look would be the really tiny bag, maybe some really big styled hair, and Denali didn't have either of those things. And so it was missing elements of Olivia, but then also, you know, Olivia has a big smile on the runway. There just wasn't, I think, a lot to imitate. And I think the transformation really just never reached its final form. It's gonna be a rock. For me. Next up, have the lambs stopped screaming, Simone? This was one of the most bizarre runways we have ever seen. She is in this like muscled, bedazzled bodysuit covered by a beige skin straight jacket with a flower crown. What the hell? But at the same time, this is perfectly on brand with Utica Queen. It's high concept, it's weird, tells a story, and it has that gorgeous nightmare element that I really look forward to in Utica Couture. It rubs the lotion on its skin or else it gets the hose again. This look is hot. What's even better though, is that the transformation is also there. Simone totally dropped her Simonisms to take on this wide-eyed kind of kooky persona, which I think was a good imitation of Utica. She's like floating and dipping and ducking and giving us drama and camp in a way that she usually doesn't. Simone's transformation was undeniably hot. Next up, if it's coming from a place of love, that's all that matters. I really loved that sentiment from Rue tonight. Utica was very cautious to wear this look that Simone wanted to give her. It was a look from the movie called BAPS starring Halle Berry. BAPS standing for Black American Princesses. I think some viewers of the show may be confused why Utica was so cautious to wear this look, right? It's just a garment. But I think it's important to remember we're in an era of accountability and examining ourselves under a microscope because it's important that we continue to learn, grow, improve, and use privilege where we have it to recognize situations that could be considered appropriation, which was why I think Rue's message about the topic was so poignant. And of course, y'all know I love this look because it has the two things about Simone that I love the most, hairography and 90s inspiration. The fit, the fashion, the glamour. It was stunning on Utica. This look was absolutely hot. And the transformation. When Utica walked out on the runway, I was like, oh my God, there's a new queen in the competition. Who the hell is that? The goofball was gone and replaced with this high fashion editorial model. This is one of the first times we saw Utica really take herself seriously on the runway, which was cool to see. I think she was also able to shed a little bit of that persona and radiate some natural confidence from within, which ultimately was the goal of this challenge, right? To have each queen learn something new about themselves through their partner. Overall, I'd say this queen earned her crown tonight. This transformation was hot. Next up. 
I thought we already saw Tina Burner on the runway to- Oh, that's Gottmik. Okay, so this look. I think Gottmik looks great. She's on fire from head to toe. It's very early Gaga, you know, party up top, no pants on the bottom. Sounds like my kind of night. I'm not so sure the glasses as an accessory really improve this look though. I think really they just kind of hid Gottmik's face as the judges pointed out. And we really didn't get to see the candyisms in the makeup until she was finally asked to remove them. The only thing was though, I'm not really sure this looks screamed candy. Her runways are fun, fashionable, and inspired by iconic moments, but I can't sit here and think of like one thing that is undeniably candy on the runway. So while the outfit could have started in Gottmik's closet for all we know, I do think it is absolutely on her body. The transformation, as I was kind of getting at, I think needed a little more kindling though. Gottmik on the runway was like a little kid when you give them too much candy. She was just like running all over the place, dropping down on her knees, do, like just doing the all kinds of crazy movements and stuff that I don't think we've ever seen Candy do on the runway. It was like she was trying to imitate Candy's personality in physical movement rather than be Candy on the runway. And I didn't feel the burn. So this transformation for me is going to be a Next up, she's here for your amusement. It's candy. The look itself <gasps> was iconic. It's very much Bob the Drag Queen's black and white clown look she did a few years ago, but more pared down and club kitty. The color palette of this outfit, styling, and makeup is Gottmik to a T. This look is undeniably gender bent punk rock fashion clown Gottmik realness. It's hot. <laughs> but the transformation, was she acting? Hooks! <laughs> ah! I'm acting. I was a bit half and half here. There were some Gottmik isms, the little rock and roll hand symbol that she did on the runway, the high gorge, but I think Candy was right. They have the hardest transformations to complete across the sets of Queens tonight. And not just because of outfit sizes and different body shapes, but because I think being a Candy or being a Gottmik is something very intangible. I think both are ultimately very difficult to emulate, which was the real challenge in their duo. I also think that because they were such good friends to start that actually hindered them. They didn't get to see their differences and instead I think saw more of their commonalities. Like Gomic is typically a little more theatrical in her runways, but I definitely saw Candy try a couple of different things and we gotta give her credit for that. So I'm gonna leave this one at a warming as for the judges tonight, I kind of felt bad for them. Rue was probably pissed that she already used her double save. Girl, this would have been the night to use it. Because actually, I think this was one of the most fun makeovers and best challenges that we have seen on Drag Race in a long time. I do ultimately agree with the bottom placement of Denali and Olivia Lux, but I would have swapped the placements of Team Rose and Tina with Team Candy and Gottmik. I think from a viewer's perspective, we do have to recognize Gottmik and Candy are very much getting the winner circle edit. They are Rue favorite children this season and I think that's okay as long as it's not like ultimately interfering with the outcomes maybe a few episodes ago we should have seen some different placements but this episode I think was overall correct at least from what we saw my hottest tonight who I think had the best look and really challenged themselves to be different was Utica I asked my patrons to vote for their hottest hot and this week they've also chosen Utica thanks so much for watching and I'll see y'all next time love ya bye it's me, Bussy, and welcome back to Hot or Rat. And today we'll be reviewing episode 11 of RuPaul's Drag Race season 13 in a comfortable pair of basketball shorts, of course. In the main challenge, our queens created personally branded commercials for cans of pop for my Midwesterners. That's Coke for all my Southerners and soda for the rest of the English speaking world. And on the runway, the category was Beast Couture. Now, let's pop off. First up, beauty or beast. Get you one that can do both. It's Utica. She is giving me satanic B-movie realness. <laughs> Girl, Barry never looked better. I loved Utica's runway so much tonight because it was different from everyone else's and I think hit the challenge nail on the head better than some of the other queens. I mean, the category was beast couture and Utica gave us exactly that. A custom fashion of her own with that spooky, kooky, nightmarish glamour quality that, again, I love and appreciate so much from Utica's runways. I love the little trails of yellow fur going down the dress and the detail of the fur on the nails. Her mind? <gasps> Beastly. The only thing I maybe would change here is to put some bigger horns on this look. You know I love my queens extra horny. But I suppose it really is more about the motion in the ocean than the size of the ship. Just kidding. If that ship ain't a beast, then bitch, I'm not sailing. <laughs> 
I don't think the judges appreciated this look enough, which I think ultimately will help cement Utica as one of the most fashionable queens to ever hit the runway in the history of the franchise. This look is hot. In the main challenge, I think Utica, yet again, though, proves she is an acquired taste. She'll need to figure out how to harness that insane mind of hers if she wants to succeed in the rest of this competition, because it's clear the judges do not understand her. That said, her ad was a little directionless at first, but I think ultimately found its footing in the second half, and I did get a chuckle, <laughs> if but a small one. It was a rat, but maybe not worthy of bottom two. Stay tuned until the end, and I'll tell you who I think should have been there. Next up, abductor. I hardly know her. I <laughs> have no idea what the tuck I am looking at. But in fashion, maybe that's a good thing. I think Candy kind of like challenged us with this Area 51 New Mexico Roswell alien fantasy thing that she did. The story behind this is that she apparently left her ship and went back down to wherever they were at to grab her good Judy who's wearing the same makeup as her, which is a fun detail on the doll, but like, so where did you come up with this? She must have been drinking some of that case special when she was thinking of this runway. For another category, I think this would have been really great. Maybe one that was blatantly extraterrestrial. I'm just not so sure it was beast. Even though she put a little bit of fur on her boobies and her Gucci. So because this look didn't really fit the theme of beast, I am going to have to give it a even though she did step outside of her ship to really challenge herself artistically on the runway. As for Candy's K special, I'll take two. I almost couldn't believe that they let her use that name for her drink, but then again, RuPaul's favorite pastime is <gasps> dang. Don't bother with the ice. I'll take this warm milk hot. <laughs> Next up, turn it and burn it one last time. It's Tina Burner. This look is giving me patchwork voodoo doll, Coraline, corpse bride, stitched together realness. Oh, and she looks just like Gooby. <laughs> Girl, that movie alone was enough to give me PTSD for the rest of my life. I did not need to relive it on the RuPaul's Drag Race runway. As Alaska would say, Tina, this makeup is terrible. But maybe it was intentional this time. Usually I have an eye roll response to Tina's runways, but this one kind of kept me scratching my head. It was at least intriguing and I think definitely fit the theme of beast. But then again, so did that transformation she did on Rosé last week. <laughs> And of course, she did patch in her signature red, yellow, and orange colors, but it at least felt a bit different for Tina. And I liked the artistic approach to this runway. And thank God it didn't have an unnecessary reveal. The runway category was beast. And that's exactly what she served us. <laughs> we can't be mad at it. This look for me is going to be a soft hot. But in the main challenge, where were the jokes? She overthought her scripts, didn't land any jokes, and I think even worse, relied on cliches so tired that not even Simone's sweet tooth drink could wake it up. Was this performance a rat? Deserving of bottom two? Hell yes. Next up, how does that phrase go? The bigger the hoop, the bigger <gasps> the fursona? Audie from Animal Crossing has never looked better. She came onto the run rag ready to shake the trees, pluck the weeds, and crawl right up into Nook's cranny. When she came out and I saw this, I was so appreciative of how unique everybody is left in this competition. Like everyone approached this runway so differently and it was fun. It was really refreshing. Simone's Beast wasn't really scary, but it was a little disturbing. This look has that lifelike fursuit thing going on and you're wondering like, what's her motive? And I love that she was able to so much make this her own. The booty shorts, the tank top, the, the big hoop earrings. It's so perfect. I mean, for Fox sake, this look is hot. In the main challenge, Simone again pretty much proves she just has to talk to be funny. <laughs> The only thing I'm getting a little bit concerned about for her is this character that she's doing anytime she has to be funny is kind of the same every time. Deborah, Factory, Sweet Tooth. You know, it's almost feeling a little played out, but at the same time, as long as I'm laughing, I'm not that worried about it because the ad certainly was funny as hell. And I genuinely think she was one of the only ones that successfully branded and marketed to me a drink that I wanted to buy. Like. Even if I was gonna end up with three gold crowns in my mouth, I wanted them because they looked so good on her. This ad was hot. Next up, ah, real monsters. It's Gottmik. I thought this look was a reference to Oblina from that little cartoon, but apparently it's not. It's just a furry monster. 
Still great though. I guess this is what Gaga meant when she told us to show her our teeth. The look is campy, cartoony, fun, but also punk and edgy. Very much old drag, but make it new and fashion forward. Gomic continually proves on the runway that she's not going to be trapped inside anyone's boxes because she'll chew her way out. And I also love that she put teeth on the boots and continues to switch up her makeup for every single runway to make it a fresh, exciting experience every time we see her on the screen. I'm sure her trips to the dentist aren't cheap, but looking like this, I'd say they're worth it. This look is hot. <laughs> However, in the main challenge, I wasn't slimming. Paris Hilton came back. And this, I think, was an example of a person on Drag Race trying to recreate some of the success that they had previously in a comedy challenge by using the same character, but failing miserably. It's kind of like the opposite of what happened with Simone. She can keep going back to that character that she does, but when Gottmik tried it, it didn't work. None of the punchlines landed ultimately, and the drink was confusing. I didn't understand what I was supposed to be getting from it, and the two shots that she did were like the exact same. It, there was no before and after. There was just like before and after, but one time you're happy that it happened. It was a bizarre, bizarre commercial. Gottmik's got sex, drink, pop can thing left me sick. It was a I actually think her performance was so bad, it did deserve bottom two. And you maybe could argue that her runway saved her and maybe put her one step ahead of Utica, but only if you think that Utica's runway wasn't also amazing, which I personally think it was one of the best tonight. Let me know what y'all think about that swap down in the comments below. Next up, Bo! She is giving us a Sully from Monsters, Inc. fantasy. I enjoyed the reference to Monsters, Inc., but I kind of felt a little bit blue balled with it for some reason. It just didn't quite go as far as I wanted it to. I wanted some more gore or some more whore. It it was, I think, ultimately too pretty with the little icy blue cat suit. And I know it sounds crazy to be using pretty as a critique, but sometimes ugly is better. Like, let's turn that happy little cartoon into a nightmare. Dip those horns in some blood. Put Boo's little mangled body inside of your outfit or something. Don't just give me this fun little cute reference. Change it up. Overall, I did want more, but it's cute and ultimately different for Olivia and very on theme for the runway. So I'm gonna give this one a soft hat <laughs> because I know the scream in that animation will make her stronger. As for her commercial, all I can remember is Bryce walking towards me in his underwear from that sunset. He gets a hot, but I was left confused by her commercial. It was kind of funny, but in that you're laughing at it and not with it way, and it did not make me live, although I don't think it deserved bottom two. It was a rat. Next up, Tumnus from Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, but breed him with the devil. It's Rosé. In contrast to Olivia's, for example, this is the bigger silhouette, the more fur, that extra push that I wanted from this beastly runway. She is maybe the only one that took it to a super dark place while also giving us a fully realized character. I particularly loved those like 12 inch little tendril nails that she has going on and how she has those same material of those nails poking out of her shoulders. Overall, I'm really loving this turn that Rose is having in terms of pushing herself outside of her little pink box and finding this more like artistic expressionist spirit inside of her. She found a lot of success tonight, even if it meant selling her soul to the devil. I think it was worth it. This look is hot. And in the main challenge, she let down her perfect pink armor and again, showed us that vulnerable side and allowed herself to be ugly. Hi, ugly. Rose at her best is actually Rose at her worst. And I think that's true for a lot of people, especially ones that are on like reality TV or whatever, when they have that armor up so thick, it's just hard to relate. But her self-deprecation was funny. Her punchlines landed and I understood exactly what she was trying to sell me. And I'm not her manager or anything, but I actually think Rose could be a great real life product for her to sell, maybe a drag con or something. Her drink was so Rose and Simone share the win this week. Let me know what y'all thought about that down in the comments. I would have been okay actually with just Rose taking the win. I think her ad and runway really pushed her over the top this week. But that's not to say I didn't also love both of those things from Simone and I'm not too mad about my fave adding another notch of wins to her belt. Simone. 
Tina Burner and Utica end up in the bottom two. And again, I would have swapped Utica for Gomic, but girl, we know the judges wouldn't put Gomic in the bottom if she asked them to. And tonight, my hottest hot on the runway goes to Gomic. I also asked my patrons to vote for their hottest hot, and this time they chose Rose. Click the link in the description of this video to join my Patreon family today, where my members get access to exclusive content, early access to my main videos, access to the Bussy Queen Discord server, and more. And don't forget to click like on this video if you're thirsty, and to press subscribe if you want more Bussy in your life. See y'all next time. Love ya. Bye. Hi, Ugly. It's me, Bussy, and welcome back to or and today we'll be reviewing the nice girls roast from rupaul's drag race season 13. and today's episode is a little different because while i was watching the roast i noticed that not every queen had the same amount of airtime and there's been a lot of talk about this season being rigged so naturally i decided to suck all the fun out of the comedy challenge by using math to calculate how funny each queen was using the rupaul laugh score a metric i just made up which divides the number of times rupaul laughs at a queen's jokes by the amount of airtime in seconds they had during the roast, rounded to the second decimal place, and multiplied by 100. RuPaul's age. Okay, but seriously, did anybody think it was kind of weird that all of the girls only made fun of their age? And I was like, girl, RuPaul is so old, she's probably heard all these jokes before. Hell, she probably wrote them. No, seriously, she's so old, she probably doesn't even know what a VPN is. Can you imagine? Now, let's see what these queens cooked up. First up, Candy Muse. It was really brave of her to give herself the opening position for the roast, but then again, I wasn't surprised because I know she loves to start shit. <laughs> okay, seriously though, wow, wow, wow. She killed it. I was a little nervous. Her set started out slow, but once she found her footing, girl, she was running. I think it was probably also really tough for Candy because I, like many others, I assume had high hopes for her because every time comedy has been presented as a challenge so far this season, she succeeded. The RuPaul Mark channel, the Snatch Game, and of course the recent Soda Pop commercial. Candy made RuPaul laugh 12 times and had a total of 166 seconds of screen time for the roast, which by the way, was the longest of any of the queens this episode. And after much munch crunch crunching the numbers, I came up with an RLS of 7.23 for Miss Candy. And not only did she make RuPaul laugh, but she looked gorgeous doing it. Candy, I'm amused. This set was hot. Next up, the more wins they have, the harder they fall. It's Simone. She was another queen that I had very high hopes for. All those challenges that Candy did really well at, Simone either did just as well or won those challenges. Like she literally just wrote a bunch of jokes for that soda pop commercial they did and she won that challenge. So it really surprised me when she failed to write not even one knee slapper for her set. Had she come out as like the sweet tooth character from that commercial though, I think she would have killed it. And I'm not totally sure if she was trying to change up her style or something with this or if it was just nerve. But she did make RuPaul laugh four times, and they gave her 125 seconds of airtime for an RLS of 3.20. Simone Soda Pop gave everybody a sweet tooth last week, but tonight her roast was rotted. But also, like she has never made flopping look so beautiful, she is giving me Glambot C3PO realness. Next up, she should have just performed this set for the train's runway. It's Utica. Get it? Because it was a train wreck. I think actually this was categorically the worst roast of all time across every season and country. <laughs> and that's saying something. Like she is the only roaster to get reverse roasted by a guest judge. <laughs> Not to mention, she got the very special prize of a double birdie from RuPaul. So like record breaking, but in all the wrong ways. And yeah, I never knew she was such a size queen. On a real note though, this is somebody who literally wore a hat made of squirrels instead of an afro to avoid cultural appropriation. So I was shocked to see her make those non-politically correct size jokes about literally everyone. Like I think there's very few people out there that can be funny just by throwing out insults without wrapping them in clever jokes. Bianca Del Rio comes to mind, maybe Joan Rivers, but even she was a little more graceful. And I'm not sure what it is, maybe it's the delivery of it, but like Bianca could call me a <gasps> guzzling ugly <gasps> and I would ask her to do it again. Utica's first joke was good though, and I did count a total of two RuPaul laughs, although I think the second one was just out of shock over the course of her 136 seconds of airtime. This awards Utica the lowest RLS score of the group at 1.47. This set was so out of touch, I thought a boomer wrote it. But hey, at least we got to see Tina Burner's train conductor jacket hit the runway one more time. This was a rat. 
Also, it is worth noting she did make an apology about the size jokes on Twitter immediately after the episode aired. So here's that. Next up, she was born a comedian, baby. I was nervous for Gottmik in this challenge. We know she's funny. We've seen the Snatch Game of Paris Hilton. And then she tried to do Paris Hilton again in that soda pop commercial, but it went flat. But thankfully she shed the character this time. And it turns out Gottmik by her own little self is funny as hell. So all that really showed me is that apparently sketch writing and stand up are two completely different skill sets. But I wouldn't know because I never do stand up. I'm always on my back. Ow, ow. Firstly, I wanna say I am so in love with her look tonight. The green makeup and that crazy bird's nest, but make it fashion and put together Helena Bonham Carter hair she's wearing is fabulous. She had great setups, great punchlines. I think every single one of her jokes landed. Maybe the only queen to have every single one of them get a laugh out of the people there and me. Which did feel a little strange because everyone else seemingly had at least one thing they said that didn't go over well. And then I was like, wait, that set was so short. And it was, it was only 107 seconds. The shortest of the group and almost an entire minute shorter than, for example, Candy's. So I was like, hmm, what are they doing here? Like, was her set just shorter or did they cut out the bad parts and only leave the good to like maybe push the narrative that she's gonna win the episode? And then she didn't win. So I have no idea why her set was so short, but it did make RuPaul laugh seven times for an RLS RuPaul laugh score of 6.54, the second highest of the group. Gottmik, never do sit down. This set was hot. <laughs> Next up, Olivia Lux. I was hoping from her time spent as Denali on the runway that she learned to be a little spicy with her nicey. Unfortunately, maybe not enough time spent hanging with our ice queen. Olivia flopped, plain and simple. It was really uh, kind of upsetting because I thought that she was maybe gonna like twist the nice girl thing into a totally mean girl <gasps> thing, but never really delivered on that. And then the other confusing thing was that she was hilarious when she was making fun of RuPaul, but for everyone else, it just wasn't funny. And I do have to say, even though her set overall was not great, she had, I think the funniest joke of the entire night. RuPaul is so old that she signed the Declaration of Independence as parent slash guardian. <gasps> Bitch. If she could have made old age jokes about everyone there, maybe she would have won. Who knows? But this was a rat. She did make RuPaul laugh though a total of four times over her 113 seconds of airtime they gave her, giving her an RLS of 3.54. And finally, they say her hair's so big because it's full of tool. <laughs> It's Rosé. First up, Rosé had an amazing stage presence. Seriously, I think those shoulder pads took up over half the stage. <laughs> Her jokes were a little wordy, but really landed when she got to the punchlines. I think she also was the most confident on stage. She was right at home and she had memorized her entire set. I think no one else managed to do that. So props to you, mama. She could have dug in a little deeper and maybe been a little thornier, but maybe was afraid to get too harsh. But I was impressed. I really was, I laughed. And the crazy thing is, I don't think this is the same Rose that entered the competition 500 episodes ago. I don't know if it's evolved or just finally showing us her true colors, but I really am falling in love with Rose. It's just like every single week her flower blooms a little more. So over the course of her 150 second set, the second longest, RuPaul laughed nine times for an RLS of 5.73. Overall, that outfit, <laughs> that was a choice, but the set was a safe bet. This was a hot closing. And now I'd like to roast myself because if you can't roast yourself, how in the hell are you gonna roast anybody else? Can I get an amen? Buzzy queen? More like bedroom queen. I spent so much time in my bedroom. The last time my friends saw me, they thought I was sleepwalking. No, seriously, I like never leave my bedroom. The last time I performed on a stage, there was only one drag race franchise, NASCAR. <laughs> Unfortunately, I did not audition, but I would have been perfect for it because everyone loves watching a car crash, right? <laughs> But really though, I mean, I spend so much time on my channel recording videos, editing videos, managing the YouTube community. I mean, you'd think I didn't have a life. I don't. <laughs> and for someone that spends like eight hours at a time staring at their own face editing footage, you'd think I would learn what not to do with makeup. 
It turns out you can't fix ugly. <laughs> Okay, okay. I hope you enjoyed that enough to at least press the like button on this video. Now let's wrap up. So Candy takes the win this week, deservedly so, and also has the highest RLS score, RuPaul Laugh score. That's, you know, remember my own little metric I made up? Which also perfectly predicted each queen's placement this week. I may be onto something. But let me know what you thought. Did this scoring system make sense? Did how the judges placed the queens make sense? Who was your favorite roaster tonight? Let me know down in the comments below. In our bottom two, we have Utica and Simone. And Simone slays the lip sync and Utica. Sasha! Is away back to her whale family in the ocean. Girl. <laughs> I still cannot believe that she did a whale noise joke to Nina. And my hottest hawk, AKA favorite roaster this week was Candy Muse. I also asked my patrons to vote for their hottest hot, and this week they've also chosen Candy Muse. Click the link in the description of this video to join my patron family today. That's my exclusive members only website where my patrons get cool benefits like early access to my videos, earning even credits, access to the Bussy Queen Discord server, and more. See y'all next time. Love ya. Bye. Hi, ugly. It's me, Bussy, and welcome back to or that. And today we'll be reviewing episode 13 of RuPaul's Drag Race season 13. In the main challenge, our queens acted in Honey, I Shrunk the Drag Queens, and on the main stage, the runway category was Out Pocket. I'll be breaking all that down for you, and since we're in the final four, we're going to be doing something special. I've been having so much fun using math in my videos lately, I guess I really am getting older, that I thought we could go ahead and calculate each queen's score in the competition thus far. You know, just get a good idea of where everybody's standing. I mean, we have had 13 episodes, and I'll be awarding points as follows. A main challenge win is worth five, placing high, four, save three, low, two, and landing the bottom two and lip syncing for your life, <gasps> only one point. And by the end of today's video, we should have a pretty good idea of the answer to the question rooted in math, who should take home the crown? Me, of course. The winner of RuPaul's Drag Race is... Bussy Queen. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I know the haters are gonna say, I didn't win a single challenge. And that I didn't even walk the runway. What? Hell, I wasn't even in this season, and I barely do drag. I mean, I'm not even wearing pants right now. <laughs> but this means so much to me, and I just want you to know, your franchise is going to be safe with me, Bussy Queen, the winner of season th- Silence! Bring back my girl! First up, our dearly departed, Olivia Lux. She's giving me Mrs. Claus cosplaying as the cold that Santa gave you when you were naughty but pressured into a diamond after years and years of hard work. Firstly, wow, she looks gorgeous. This runway I think would have been really great for like a bow category, but it just doesn't say pockets. Like she kind of looks like the Christmas present that you want to unwrap first, but your parents make you wait until the very end to open her up. I wonder what's inside. I think as a standalone runway, this look is absolutely undeniably hot. However, the runway category was out pocket. And I'm just not really sure this garment said that. Like everyone else pushed themselves somewhere new, tried something different, and Olivia kind of did the same thing that she's been doing on the runway pretty consistently, which is show up and look really pretty, but nothing too memorable. Something about this look is just too, I think, pedestrian, as beautiful as it is for what the runway was calling for. She's cute enough that I want to put her into my pocket and take her with me everywhere I go. But for this runway category, I'm going to have to give this diamond a zirconium Rat. And in the acting challenge, the theme of samity, yes, I did just invent that, continues through. We see that same kind of oddly nice, but afraid to be dynamic character that we saw in the roast and in other previous acting challenges. She is so scared to, I think, step outside of her box, which is ironic because she said that she's there to explore, but I think she doesn't know where to explore yet. At least that's just my read on the situation. Like how many times can you pick the nice girl role and be told that you need to do more with it. Honestly, I kind of think it might have even been a little bit of a trap that the producers put that role in the script at all just to see if she would pick it. Welcome back to Conspiracy Theories with Buzzy Queen. Yeah. I feel like, as her sisters also expressed on the main stage tonight, we may have seen every shade of light that Miss Lux has to offer at this current time. 
A thespian she was not tonight. This was a rat performance. And I know she didn't make it to our final four, but I did go ahead and calculate her score just for fun. She left the competition gracefully with a strong 35 points. Like, let's not forget her winning the disco mentory in Bossy Rossi episodes. She was a fierce competitor in this competition. I just don't think she was ready for prime time quite yet, especially considering the talent level of the performers. But imagine Olivia in like even one year, two years? I am scared for the girls that have to go up against her in All Stars. Next up, for sure, maybe, for sure, not, for sure, F, for sure, bum, 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 bum. It's Simone. Pour one out for all the scene kids. I was one. <laughs> I think it is a universal truth that every little gay scene kid is now a drag queen. Pheromone, for instance. Here's some of my scene kid pictures. Scene culture may seem cringy today, but I would not have lived my teenage years any differently. I loved every second of waking up in the morning and spending 45 minutes straightening and teasing my hair every single day. <laughs> Anyways, back to Simone. This runway had me gagged, bound, and chained. I love that she found a way to integrate scene culture into this out pocket couture look, which by the way is jaw dropping and oh, is that a Simone in your pocket? Or are you just happy to see me? Like, she's the pocket, she's the jeans. What? It's incredible. Zipper? I hardly know her. <laughs> Anyways, her fly was down, but she crushed, crushed, crushed this runway. This look was hot. And the main challenge, yes, Deborah takes us back to the Sweet Tooth Factory once more. God knows if there's an acting challenge next episode, she'll take us there again. But I'm kind of not that mad about it. I mean, she found something that works and she milked it. I would have done the same thing. And I have seen some people be a little upset about that online, but honestly, I think if you're upset that Simone is reusing a successful character, maybe we should actually be looking towards the production and seeing that they kind of are giving our queens an opportunity to reuse things and redo things maybe one too many times this season. Season. I don't know, just food for thought. And at this point, if she doesn't integrate that character into her main drag character, like fully, then I'll just be upset about it. Anyways, her confident performance in a kind of shaky from the production side challenge was a hat. And ring the bell, sound the alarm, Simone enters the top four with 43 points, with four wins for the Congratulations Brew Mix, the RuPaul Mark Channel acting challenge, the makeover with Utica, and the Soda Pop commercial challenge. But she's also been in the bottom twice, once for the Rizical and once for the roast. Next up, what's black, white, and pink all over? It's Rose. And this is not the first time we've seen her stunt in a garment inspired by a bygone decade. Remember her Bette Midler big business look she did back in the bag ball? This outfit, it's 60s, it's mod, there's a reveal. She's ready for a rainstorm and God knows what's in all those pockets, maybe some of mommy's little helpers. I like the garment, but I kind of don't like the final execution of everything she did to style this outfit. I think the hair, stockings, and heels didn't really work well with the rest of the look. Like the hair itself, for example, I think would have looked a lot better if she had done an actual 60s, more Valley of the Doll style look. You know, something off the shoulders. It just kind of looks like it's suffocating her around her like shoulders and back or something. And then there was also a weird moment where she's talking about the unique style of makeup from this era in her confessional while the look is on the run way, but then she really didn't change her makeup for this at all. I think it's a little harsh for a 60s look. I don't know, maybe I'm crazy. What do y'all think? The garment is absolutely out pocket. It's hot on its own, but the styling, not my personal preference. I have to give this look a rat. However, in the acting challenge and Oscar, she may win. I kind of thought the writing in this, if we can call it a movie, uh, left a little bit to be desired, but Rose really made the most of what she had. Anytime she had a line, she delivered it confidently with that knowing wink in her eye. I mean, she is an excellent actress, actor, thespian, and she's proving it time and time again. Anything the other queens can do, she can do it better. They better watch out. This performance was and Rosé is entering the top four with a staggering 46 points, the most of any of our queens so far. And by the way, she's our only pork chop queen to even be in the top five. Started from the bottom, now she's here. <laughs> As a reminder, she won the Rusical, the Soda Pop commercial challenge, and could have shared a win in Snatch Game. She's like the EGOT queen of this top four. She is a force to be reckoned with. It really is amazing to see Rosé come so far in this competition, and to also see her grow. She's listening to the judges. She is is adjusting how she's performing. I mean, that is what you have to do to win and she's doing it. Anyways, next up, 
How many pockets could a drag queen fit on a pocket dress if RuPaul had a pocket runway in her pocket? Let's ask Candy Muse. My God. <laughs> Normally you save your best for last, but Candy is doing the opposite. And I don't want to be too harsh on her because even she knows this wasn't a great look and admits on the main stage she didn't feel good when she put it on. And for that, I really feel for her. At least she knew that it was a rot on sight. But girl, like what am I looking at? What is this? Like what possessed you to even put this in a suitcase? It's wild. Honestly, it's so ugly. She may be onto something. Or she may be on something, not sure. <laughs> it's kind of giving me like the haphazard laziness of La La Ree's bag dress creation, combined with the meticulous chaotic detail of Tamisha Iman's bag dress that she created. And then of course, if Candy then finally stitched everything together with a neon green ribbon. But yeah, this look is a certified rot. Uh, but in the acting challenge, I actually enjoyed her performance. Honestly, I think everyone did well in this challenge, Olivia being the obvious weakest of the group, but the remaining four, I mean, the judges were probably splitting hairs to decide who was going to be in the bottom. Like, I don't know if I personally could have chosen without also including the runways in my decision. Like, if you held a shrink ray to my head and made me choose, I guess I would have to say Candy, because she could have taken that evil villain role a little bit further. But I honestly still have to say that she gave a hot performance. So Candy enters the top four with the lowest amount of points of any of our four with 37 points. But that ain't that far behind like Simone who has the third most with 43. And Candy has had a bit of a rocky performance now lip syncing for her third time. But she also did win a challenge, the roast last episode. And it can't be ignored that anytime there was a comedy challenge put in front of her, she kind of killed it. And every time she has a lip sync, she earns her spot in the competition once again, like her or not she is talented. Candy's been really interesting to watch because she's either been really great or sitting alone in the BTM. See what I did there? And a lot of people are mad that she's made it this far, but I think she's proven time and time again that she has earned her spot in the competition. And finally, does anyone know what time it is? Oh, that's right. It's time to crash the system. It's Gamic. Damn. This runway stole a piece of my heart. It's so great. This is the Hercules sundial thing that she was referencing in her confessional, by the way. Like that is such a niche thing to bring to your drag fashion, but only icons think of such. Gomic's look is giving me underground New York street fashion, just robbed a Rolex store and is now pawning them off to pedestrians at Paris Fashion Week realness. This look is so gorgeous, timeless. I mean, it's different for Gomic, which is fun. But then again, Gomic does something different on the runway every week, which is what makes her such a treat. Like every single week, I'm pretty much wondering what is Gottmik going to be wearing, and she never disappoints. And I never judge a queen by the size of their timepiece, but maybe it's time to start. This look is hot. In the main challenge, Gottmik was allergic to pussy, but still snatched a win in my book. <laughs> I was really happy to see Gottmik translate her natural comedic timing and energy into the acting challenge, something that I think she's kind of struggled with a bit throughout the competition, but really nailed in the roast and cemented in this challenge as well. This is another contestant like Rosé we've seen listen to the judges, apply that feedback to their performance and just get better and better every episode. Like, have y'all ever seen a sneeze look so sexy? I don't think so. This performance was and Gomic enters the top four with 44 points. Two less than Rosé, one more than Simone, and a couple more than Candy. She brings with her two wins, one for the bag ball and one for the snatch game. Arguably two of the most important challenges in Drag Race. And also has zero bottom placements. But that's a topic for another video. In fact, I've already talked about it. And Gomic is just doing so well. Like I actually thought she could have won the roast and maybe even this challenge. But I suppose it's only fair the judges spread the wins out amongst the rest of the queens. But yeah, our top four honestly is really amazing. And the top three scores are so close. I don't even think there is a way to predict or call who's going to take the crown. I mean, if you were just going based off numbers alone right now, of course, Rosé, but there is a strong argument, depending on how the next episode or two episodes go, that Gottmik and Simone could take the crown as well. I think we can safely say, mathematically speaking, that Candy probably won't be taking the crown. That is, unless the next Next episode or two, she pulls out some more wins, which is very possible. So I'm gonna keep my eyes peeled there. This week, my hottest hat on the runway goes to Simone. I just can't let my little scene sister go without a hottest hot. I also asked my patrons to vote for their hottest hot, and this week they've chosen Gottmik. 
So at this point in the competition, when we have a final four, Drag Race does typically do a retweet your favorite winner, share the hashtag, et cetera, et cetera, but we're not seeing that. So that tells me something's gonna be a little bit different for this season, probably due to the you know pandemic that we have going on and they may end up doing a final three and then a more traditional lip sync for the crown, kind of like how they used to do back in the earlier seasons of the yesteryear. Only 90s babies will remember. But let me know what you think about that. Do you agree with our top four? Who do you think will enter the final three? And who do you think is going to take the crown? See y'all next time. Love ya. Bye. Hi, ugly. It's me, Buzzy. And welcome back to Hot or Rat. And today, I'm excited to say that I spent way too much time on Google Sheets coming up with a formula that can predict drag race winners most of the time. You see, there's tons of formulas and equations out there that can measure how well a queen did in a competition, but rarely, if ever, do those actually line up with who wins. My equation that we'll call the bus stop score uses the following metrics I've identified to be key predictors of who will actually take the crown once they've entered the finale. Number one, highest wins. Having the highest number of main challenge wins across a season, even if tied, correctly predicts the winner about 70% of the time. Number two, fan sentiment on Twitter. I found that the queen that receives the highest number of retweets on the official RuPaul's Drag Race Twitter, you know, retweet if your team Simone tweets correctly can predict the winner about 69% of the time. Next, we have net wins, which is something I invented, which takes the total number of wins each queen receives throughout the competition and subtracts the number of times that they were in the bottom. And finally, the elusive, never bottoms title. Can't really if a queen has never been in the bottom, this indicator can predict them winning 60% of the time. The bus stop formula takes all of those predictors and weighs them against a contestant's actual performance across a season and then sums up all those points to come up with a final score that correctly predicts the winner in regular US seasons of RuPaul's Drag Race and Drag Race All-Stars 82 point. 3-5% of the time. That's 14 out of 17 seasons. The three seasons in this data set that the formula did not work for are really special seasons that we'll talk about at the end of this video, so stay tuned for that. Today, we'll be going through and breaking down each of our top four's final drag excellence runways, talking a little bit about their performance in the music video, Lucky, and then finally calculating their bus stop score. By the end of the video, I'll be able to tell you who's going to win this season. First up, <gasps> Simone. On the runway, drag? Yes. Excellence? Absolutely. She is glamorous, breathtaking, everything I want to be and more. I have admired Simone since the very first time that I saw her in that promo. No one has done it like her on the runway. I think she will go down as the most fashionable queen of all time. Some of her most notable looks being, I think, this one. Her beaded, fascinating fascinators and trains runways. I really genuinely do not believe she has had a single bad look on RuPaul's Drag Race. On top of the fact that every single time she has hit the runway, she's in a different silhouette. If there was one queen whose book I wanted to tear a page out of and put it in my own, it would be Simone's. This look is hot. And in the Lucky Music video, I'll just straight up say right now, I think everyone had a hot performance. This is, I think, one of my favorite music videos that has come out of RuPaul's Drag Race. Simone's verse represented her well, but for some reason felt a little more held back than the rest of the queens. She was singing at a slower, more relaxed pace for a song that I think maybe required a little bit more of a higher tempo as it was, it was actually my fourth favorite of the group, but amazing nonetheless. And as for Simone's bus stop score, we're talking about somebody here with four, four challenge wins, representing a skill set that includes acting, comedy, branding, and makeup. In 17 seasons of US Drag Race, that has only been done now six times for queens entering the finale. She's also very loved by the fan base. On Twitter, she received 37% of the total hashtag team retweets, officially making her the Twitter fan favorite, if you will. But she's also been in the bottom twice. We have no precedent in the regular non-all-star seasons of RuPaul's Drag Race for a queen that has been in the bottom two or more times to end up taking the crown. Brooklyn Heights, Ginger Minj, Adora Delano, and Alexis Mateo have all entered the finale with either the most amount of wins or tied for the most amount of wins and been in the bottom two or more times and then ended up not winning. That said, her bus stop score is high at a total of 4.58 points, which will make more sense in context with the other queen's scores. Next up, Candelisa. 
Muse. And if you're looking at this and thinking, hmm, this doesn't really make sense for this runway, well, the internet rumors might be giving us the tea on this. They're saying that this should have been Candy's sheer runway, which would explain the multitude of layers of sheer fabric. And the runway that she wore on her trains runway was actually what she would have worn on the drag excellence runway. Anyways, that would explain why this doesn't necessarily fit into the category of drag excellence. However, I love this garment and I think Candy looks drop dead gorgeous. Gorgeous. She's giving me like 60s retro future Jetson space princess, but make it ho vibes. It's very candy. And considering the circumstances, I'm not mad about it. I think this look is hot. In the main challenge, remember this was a bitch track and she did not at all let us down. She had her from the hood to Hollywood line. She had this little like whisper moment. There was fast rapping, unintelligible candy mumbling, and... <laughs> Overall, I think she really sold me the song. Candy's was my third favorite of the group. But over at the bus stop, what is her report card? What is she bringing home to mother? Not looking so good. Candy's entering the finale with one win from the roast and three bottom two placements, which gives her a net of negative two wins where my scoring system really penalizes queens. She also received only 5% of the total retweets on Twitter, which hurts her a lot as fan sentiment on Twitter is a huge predictor of who's going to win. But fun fact, this does put her in a rather elite group of queens that received under 10% of the Twitter fan retweet vote, including Alaska on All Stars 2, BB on All Stars 3, Roxy on Season 5, Courtney Act, Silky Ganache, and more. And I think it's important to say that because this metric does not indicate whether fans like a queen, it just indicates whether they actually want them to win. So all things considered, she finishes the competition with a bus stop score of negative 0.9. I think I can safely say that if drag race trends continue, Candy will not take the ground. And before we go any further, I do want to say thank you so much for watching this video and to remind you that my patrons make my channel possible. You can join my Patreon family over at patreon.com slash bussyqueen and for just a couple of dollars a month get exclusive benefits like early access to my videos, exclusive videos, access to the Bussy Queen Discord server, and the satisfaction of knowing that you helped me eat this month. Click the link in the description of this video to do that today. Thanks. Now let's get back to it. Next up, let's raise our glasses one last time. It's Rosé. Um, this, this look, this look, wow. It has potential. It really, really does. I love the gown. I love what it represents. It is the Scotswoman that is Rosé at heart. That said, I hate how she styled it. I really think that the black lacy gloves and that white little pink fluffy purse do not match the tone of the gown at all. Like literally, if she had just taken those things off, I think this gown would have served. It speaks for itself. This gown on the runway tonight is elegant, but the accessories turn it into a hot pile of rot for me. However, Rosé was lucky in the main challenge that it was literally built for her. Singing, writing lyrics, choreography, and apparently rapping all wrapped up into one. Check it, baby. This is drag. I fully choked on my own tongue, fell on the floor, passed out for about five minutes, and came back to my senses and was like, oh my god, that was a serve. But it still is only my second favorite verse, which I think just goes to show how much I loved everyone in this main challenge. But over at the bus stop, let's go check on her report card. Rosé enters the finale with three wins impressive, and zero bottom placements. Across 12 regular seasons, 10 queens have entered the finale with zero bottom placements, but only six have won. Could Rosé be the next one? She's also adored by the fans, having received 27.85% of the total retweets on Twitter from the RuPaul's Drag Race account. This competition is fierce and it's close. Rosé's final bus stop score comes out to 4.47, the second highest so far. Let's see if Gottmik can top her. Speaking of which, I've either been staring at my screens for way too long today or I'm seeing spots. Oh, it, it's, it's just spots. This look is sick. It is giving me Cruella de Vil, 101 Dalmatians vibes, but with the Gottmik twist, it's so great. My favorite part about this look were the negative space cutouts, both on her face and on the gown, which showed regular skin tone to contrast all of that white. I think that in combination with the white and the black perfectly just not only represents Gottmik, but kind of tells a story of her journey on the season. And like Simone, I was looking forward to what Gottmik was gonna wear on the runway every single week. I think some of my favorite looks from her were like all of her ball looks, her fascinator runway, and that crazy sea creature LeMay thing that she did. All insane works of art. Anyways, circle, circle, dot, dot. Gottmik's looking hot.
it. And in the main challenge, did anybody else get that feeling from Gottmik throughout the entire episode that carried through to the music video that she was just so happy to be there? Like every time she was on the screen and smiling, I was smiling. She just made me so happy to see her happy. Also loved her lyric, look, and choreography in the music video. She acknowledges Rue, her journey, and built herself up, I think, perfectly completing every tenet of what a bitch track verse should be. Hers was my favorite. But what's on her report card? She finishes the season with only two challenge wins, but she was never in the bottom. Again, that's really important and also gives her bonus points like Rosé. And there's never been in the history of RuPaul's Drag Race, two queens entering the finale never having been in the bottom. And what's more, she received 29.78% of the Twitter fan vote. That's the second highest of the cast and only a couple percentage points above Rosé and less than Simone. And this is the interesting part of the scoring system, which in my research found that a ball or a snatch game winner was present in every set of finalists across all regular RuPaul's Drag Race and All-Star seasons. And in 12 of those cases, the winner had also won either snatch game or the ball. And Gottmik won both, which puts her in like a legendary set of queens to enter the finale, having won both, of course, including Gigi Good, who didn't win, and Aquaria, who did win. So while what she did was legendary in and of itself, adding in bonus points for winning Snatch Game or the ball didn't change any of the previous season's results. So adding it in would only benefit Gottmik. Gottmik's total bus stop score is 3.96, the third highest. So now that we've seen all the report cards, we know that Simone will win, right? Not necessarily, but I can with 82.35% confidence say that she will. But remember, my formula isn't perfect. It failed in three cases across all 17 seasons. In those three instances, fans disproportionately preferred a finalist that did not win by a lot too. Crystal Method, for example, had a fan favorite advantage of 27%, Kim Chi in season eight of 21%, and Katya in All Stars 2 of over 77.75%. Season 12 is also really special because in every other prior season of Drag Race, either the fan favorite or the person with the most number of wins has won the crown. Instead, the win went to Jada, who by my system had the second highest bus stop score. So let's call the failure of this system an unknown variable, which we'll name the Rue factor. And that point of failure is important, but we don't have a disproportionate amount of fan support for a queen that also does not have the most number of wins. So that probably is not going to happen in this season if history repeats itself. That said, across all 17 seasons, the bus stop formula has never calculated three finalists all within 0.62 points of each other. So this is kind of uncharted territory. RuPaul's gonna have to choose between three very deserving contestants. There's Gottmik, the fresh-faced rock star of the group, trailblazing the way for people of all genders to do drag on the main stage of RuPaul's Drag Race. Then we have Rosé, the perfectionist, never had one single messed up throughout the entire competition. And she was kind of, I think, unlikable because of that in the beginning. But as she grew in the season, so did the fans, and myself included, grow to love her for who she is. And finally, Simone. The ingenue. Rue called her a star from the start, so we know that she likes her. And she has four wins, but two bottom placements, which could actually maybe work out for her. Like it kind of gives her almost a, even though she smashed the competition, an underdog-like storyline. And of course, Candy is also in the top four. I don't want to discount her placement here because she absolutely earned it, but she simply just doesn't have like a comparable score in my system to, in any realm of possibility, predict her winning. So I don't think it's likely that she will. So now that you've heard all of my crazy over analysis about this season, let me know in the comments down below who you think should win and why. And my hottest hat on the Drag Excellence Runway goes to... Simone. I also asked my patrons to vote for their hottest hot, and they also voted for Simone. See you next time. Love ya. Bye. Bye, ugly. It's me, Bussy, and welcome back to Hot or Rat. And today we'll be reviewing the grand finale of RuPaul's Drag Race Season 13. Before we get started, I want to go ahead and say congratulations to our new reigning supreme, Simone. I could not be more happy for or proud of a queen of this cast to take that crown. And of course, and I told you so is in order. The bus stop score came through, mama. Seriously though, never underestimate math or Bussy Queen, or Bussy Queen using math. Today we'll be breaking down all 25 looks from the finale, starting with each of our season 13 queens, red carpet runways, and then moving into all 12 looks of the surprise ball, of which there were three categories, black and white, red, and finale eleganza. Now, let's get started. First up, my long lost sister, Bustle Queen. Get it? Cause 
the bustle train that she has on her dress, it's Kimura. She's got this 20s art deco thing going on, which I'm loving for her. I kind of pecked her as like a 60s Valley of the Doll type of queen. And then the fact that she did this for the red carpet and has been posting tons of amazing 20s inspired looks for her unaired runways, which is for another video, that kind of gagged me. While I didn't expect Kimura to be a 20s loving feathers, flappers, and finger waves type of gal, I'm loving all the different references that she's pulling from, and this look is exceptional. She is not one note, she is a full staff. This look is hot. Next up, did somebody say wig? No? Okay, oh, hey wig. Look how big that is, that is, isn't that crazy? Thanks, Tension. Oh, right, back to the video. It's Joey J. This look is interesting. I like the actual gown by itself. There is a lot going on here tonight, though, Mama. She is in three different worlds. We've got Betty Spaghetti up top, some little gothic evanescence moments happening with that black tool train, and then these crazy, strappy 80s rhinestone heels. I'm like, girl, what's going on in that head tonight? Any one of those things could have been its own whole mood, but all mixed up together? Oh, we got a big old mess. Ultimately, I think I just have to be okay with the fact that Joey's style and my taste don't agree, and that's okay. You may love this, but I don't. For me, this look tonight is a rat. Next up, she's speaking out, and this time she's lawyered up. Did y'all see that Instagram live? Woo! It's Tamisha, and her look tonight is gorgeous. It's screaming Tamisha in only the way that a look made by Tamisha for Tamisha as custom Tamisha Couture could. I am, of course, assuming that she made it. She didn't tag any designers. And girl, y'all know our season 13 queens love designers. After that last video, I have so much more appreciation for the queens that really go out there and make most of their drag themselves. And, you know, of course, you can't expect every queen to do that because not every queen knows how or has the resources to do so. So I'm definitely not knocking using designers at all. But I'm just saying I appreciate stuff like this way more now. Anyways, classy, elegant, beautiful. This look is double D. H-O-T. <laughs> Next up, this ain't RuPaul's best friends race. It's La La Ri. Congratulations to our new Miss Congeniality. I couldn't think of a better queen to give that to. Honestly, she consistently stayed out of drama, was nice to everybody, and I think totally pleased the fan base with her crazy kooky confessionals and radiant smile every time she was on the screen. And her look, oh my God. This is La La Ri on like glow up crack. She looks amazing, ethereal goddess. And bald too, no less, mama. The jewelry, the pattern, the print, the fit, it's all there tonight. It's such a gorgeous look on her. And this glow up is so fierce that Miss La La Reed for the first time is looking like beautifully scary. Like, yeah, she is Miss Congeniality, but if you look at her the wrong way, she will cut your wigs up at night. You know what I mean? Anyways, this look is hot. <laughs> Next up, Jader. Say it with me, I hardly know her. It's Elliot. She's a queen whose looks I wasn't always a super fan of, to say the least, but this is really, really pretty. She's giving me Grand Dame Diva, mistress of it all, a little bit of Joan Crawford vibes in there as well. Something is very like matronly and like she means business in this look. That red coat over that animal print evoking maybe like a little bit of a blood fantasy. I don't know. She may be the matriarch of the jungle and meow. This look is hot. Next up, her outfit seems very pointed right now. It's Denali. Okay, I have always been a huge fan of Final Fantasy and the first thing I thought of was the little Cactar character when I saw this and I was like, oh my God, I love it so much. This entire look is genius from the little cactus spines in her wig that looks like those little shrubby cacti to the big giant cacti balloons on her arms and the little spines down her boots. It's so fresh and fun. It's also latex, so you know, it's hot as hell. I, I love everything about this. It's also very much giving me you shouldn't have eliminated me vibes, which I'm kind of living for. Oh, and fun fact, her Instagram says this look was done by the same latex shop that did Got Mix Beaded and Yellow Gorgeous Runways. Prick me, <gasps> I'm done. This look is hot. Next up, a leopard never changes its spots, but sometimes it will switch from a red to brown wig. <laughs> It's Tina Burner. This look from Tina kind of surprised me. She had so much insanity on the runway, which I think most of the time maybe didn't work out in her favor, but she really went for the details, the camp, the, <laughs> the reveals, like every single time we were just hit over the head with it. And tonight she said, you know what? I'm gonna bring it back. We're gonna have just a red sequence dress and a brown wig 
very understated for Tina. Like this was her last big moment to have an insane wow factor on the red carpet and I wasn't really taken there. It's not a bad book, right? For any other category, you know, like award show or something like that, I would totally say this look is hot. But because of what we're looking at here, red carpet, I wanna be gooped and gagged just a little bit. So I'm gonna leave this one at a rat. Next up, she's melting, she's melting. It's Utica. So this is what happens when there's an oil spill next to a glitter factory and a drag queen is stuck inside. <laughs> She just sews her way right out of there and ends up on the red carpet looking like this. I love this. It's so pretty. She's giving me like final boss in the video game realness, like Heartless from Kingdom Hearts, mixed with like a little bit of hollow energy from Bleach, that anime. I, it's really creepy and weird, but also seductively beautiful. The only thing is, I'm not totally sure this dress would work on a red carpet. Like how many people would she need around her constantly adjusting the train and like making sure she could walk through the front part of it it would be maybe a little too much work. But this was just a photo shoot and an actual red carpet, so it wasn't a problem. Utica's look tonight is a beautiful nightmare. It's hot. <laughs> Next up, Orange Livia Lux. Girl, these last two and their fabric quantity? <laughs> How many yards of fabric had to die for these looks? Her gown is literally being suspended above her, behind her. She's giving me beautiful spider in an orange of web fabric realness. The only thing I was a little confused about was like, what are those orange crazy crystals doing on her forehead? Like maybe there's five too many there. One or two would have sufficed for me, but I mean, girl, that's a small detail. Maybe she was going for a Steven Universe thing. I don't know. Anyways, this look certainly is hot. Next up, Penny, for your thoughts? or for your coin purse? It's Simone. This look is so genius. It's actually Moschino and I love every detail of it. The hat is a coin purse. The gloves, a coin purse. The boot she's carrying, a coin purse. Mama, it's beautiful. It's that perfect blend of like 90s Y2K fashion that Simone rocks the hell out of every time. And I'm so happy to see our fashion girlies of Drag Race getting the treatment they deserve from the designers in the industry. It's what they deserve. Like, look at all these girls getting fashion campaigns and clothing and shoots now. I mean, Gigi, Simone, Gottmik, Bimini from Drag Race UK. It's incredible what they're up to. Anyways, yeah, Simone, she bagged the competition in her coin purse and left no crumbs. This look is hot. Next up, it's more fashion. Fashion. Oh, by August Getty Atelier. It's coming. And y'all, I just wanna know real quick, did I sound fancy when I said that? Cause I'm just a little Texas gal and I had to Google how to pronounce Atelier. And I just wanna know if I did that right, thanks. Miss August has our little baby got Mick looking like the sci-fi ghost of future runways coming to haunt us and warn us of our dangerous descent into unattainable runways for the common drag queen. <gasps> but she looks great in it. She's giving me like marshmallow that's just been dipped into the campfire for like one second and has a little tiny flame on top and I'm living for it. Got Mick, this look is on fire and certainly hot. Okay, but seriously, I feel so poor after looking at all these looks, especially the ones we'll get to in the ball. Like if any designers are watching, please can you send me something? I wanna be fabulous, please. <sighs> Next up, buzz buzz, it's our little candy muse back in her beehives. She's giving me in this look, tiger meets fancy bird, it's really cool. I think this is hands down my favorite look that I've seen Candy in. It's just it's chic fashion forward. I love the colors on her. I also love that Candy's digging back into her roots of beehives because that was actually how we first saw her in the promo and in the reveal looks. And then I don't think we saw another one throughout the entire season, maybe like one, but as a signature thing for her, I love. And side note, speaking of designers, I just looked at the designer of this dress and Mom is thirsty. Candy, you look hot. Next up, it's Rose. And she's wearing Bicala. This is another designer who's done lots of drag fashion and performance looks for celebrities like Azalea Banks and Lady Gaga. And fun fact, they also did Aja's season nine entrance looks, help with Simone's boxer look, and did Candy's alien beast runway. 
Interesting. I really am keeping my eyes on who these queens are tagging as their designers, and I'm noticing a lot of them use the same circle of designers for all of their looks. It's crazy. There's like a couple of designers just totally dominating the drag industry right now. Anyways, back to Rosé. I'm not really sure what this look is telling me. She's got a giant gold box on one arm and big gold cuffs on the other. I don't know what they mean, but she looks beautiful. She's giving me like old chic Hollywood glamour with all these little gold details on the heels and the hair. It's a really pretty look for Rosé and I'm loving those victory rolls atop her head. Too bad they didn't help her win, but this look is absolutely hot. Now that was fun, wasn't it? But it's not over. It's time for round two. <laughs> Concerning our final four, this ball in the finale was the best thing that Drag Race has ever done in a grand finale ever. I loved it. Please do it every year. Seriously though, our final four slayed every single look hot across the board. So I'm just gonna count these down from my least to most favorites. First up, my 11th alternate for my favorite look of the ball. It's Rose's red look. This look immediately brought me back to Dolly's ghost look from Dragula Resurrection. And I'm not sure if the reference was intentional at all, but the similarities are there. Dolly's was incredible. Incredible. And you know, Diet Dragula is cool too. I think Rose looks really interesting in the look, but I just wasn't totally sure that it screamed Rose. Like I felt like she was really going out on a limb for this look, you know what I'm saying? Kind of felt like it was wearing her more than she was wearing it. Which is why this one ended up at the bottom of my list. Next up at the 11th hour, it's Candy Muse's red look. She's just your everyday little girl from the Bronx coming home from third grade, listening to her boom box. Of course, listening to nothing but Lady Marmalade and the Magic Stick. I love this high fashion yet streetwear inspired look she's done and the fact that this boom box is also calling back to the very first look we ever saw her in on RuPaul's Drag Race. I think she looks gorgeous. It's a really, really beautiful look. My favorite detail of this look is the ponytail, which is actually different pieces of hair attached together with gold rings matching the rest of her outfit. There's just so much fun personality in this look and that's what I love to see from drag. And next up, I wanna see your peacock. Your peacock. It's Candy Muse's finale look in 10th place. It's very classic drag, very pageantry. She's got ruffles, sequins, feathers, peacock feathers at that. And she looks like an entire show all on her own. Does she look gorgeous? Absolutely. It's really nice to see Candy in something so grand. And the only reason it's this low on my list was just because it's not my favorite type of look. I don't prefer things from the pageant world, as they say, while I can appreciate their beauty as I am right now. It just ended up near the bottom of my list because there were other looks that inspired me more. Next up, my fair lady, no, my fair man in a dress pretending to be a lady. It's Rose's black and white look. This was really, really crazy. The shapes, the curves, the swerves, padded for the gods, girl, I'm living for it. This look is inspired by this dress that was worn originally by Audrey Hepburn. I love that she took that into the drag world in a really unexpected way. Like, yeah, I'm not a huge Audrey Hepburn fan, so don't sue me, but I could be convinced after seeing this. Props to the designer that constructed this beautiful monstrosity of a gown, oh my God. But I kind of felt like it was wearing rosé. Same way how I felt about that first thing. Like, I'm just not really sure how those two things like came from, from rosé's personal style and vision. You know, it just felt a little disjointed, but a great look nonetheless. And next up in eighth, we have Candy repping BLM and B and W. She has on again what is now becoming a little signature for her, a beautiful beehive atop her head. I think this gown looks gorgeous on her and I think it pairs really, really well with her red carpet look. Both of these looks marry together that authentic street style and attitude that she talks about having with a chicness that really just looks so glamorous on her. Like only the baddest of bitches can pull stuff like this off and she looks gorgeous. Plus the BLM message in a black and white runway, her mind, hello. Next up, lucky number seven, black, white, and red, it's Gottmik. I saw this look in my mind immediately went to Janelle Monet, and then it went to David Bowie. And then I realized the artist who she's talking about inspired the print is Keith Haring. And I'm like, why does it sound so familiar and look so familiar? And then I start Googling and I'm like, oh, right, this guy. 
You've definitely seen this art, but you probably didn't know his name. Now you do. Congratulations. And by the way, I do recommend go do your own research on him. He's such an amazing figure and he dedicated the last part of his life as he was suffering from the complications of AIDS to raising awareness around HIV and prevention and all of this great stuff and doing charity work. So rest in peace to that LGBTQ icon and thank you Gottmik for bringing references to the runway like this and then taking them a step further and putting stuff like trans rights are humans rights on the print. Like the deeper you get into this look, the better it is and you zoom in and you realize the entire thing is covered in red rhinestones. It's gorgeous. And next up, six, six, six. The devil's in the details. And the devil's hands must have worked extra hard on this look because the details on this look, Simone's red runway are incredible. The entire look is based on one thing, a red nail, and then just blown completely out of proportion and parodied to death. First of all, look at the hair. The hands that are holding up the pigtails of her wig are made of hair and have, of course, those same red nails. The entire dress is literally plastic nails. She's got also these iconic red hangnails at the bottom of her heels, which by the way, like she had to pop all those off for her next runway. Dedicated, yes she is. I just know this look is gonna be underappreciated and here I am sitting here telling you to please appreciate it. Thanks. And next up in fifth, we have Rose's grand finale look. I was like, girl, are we in medieval times? Are we about to joust? What's going on here? In all seriousness, I really love this look. It is immaculately detailed. You zoom in on every single inch, you see something new. There's little holographic sparkles, glitters, beads, padding, the train. I mean, it's incredible. The collar. The hair. This was also the first look that I looked at Rosé in and I thought, this is Rosé, Th this is her vision. This is her in drag. Her other two looks just didn't do that same thing for me. You know what I'm saying? And you could tell she felt it too. The effortlessness in the way she just glided down the runway, ready to accept her crown. She killed it. And next up in my fourth favorite, we have Simone's finale look. One look and you'll turn to stone. I don't know what it is with Medusa in pop culture lately, but she is everywhere you look. Sorry, I saw her in Turn to Stone for a second. Um, this is beautiful. Breathtaking. She's half golden mega woman of the future, half ethereal Grecian goddess coming down to bless us from the heavens. She looks incredible. The gold dipped hair, mama. <laughs> I love her so much. I have never appreciated and like wanted to be somebody as much as I love and appreciate and want to be Simone. And in third, we have Simone's black and white look. Gagatrandra. This, all the different materials, shapes, patterns. And the hair, again, hair is never an afterthought with Simone when she's in drag. It is always at the forefront and always doing something incredible that I have never seen before. I'm convinced at this point that her power is in her wigs. She is like the biblical Samson of drag. <laughs> I love this look so much because it's like that classic princess, 18th century pannier court, Victorian ball gown, but done in the Simone way. She will never just take something and do it. She always finds something really unique and then twists it, turns it, and makes it Simone. It's gorgeous. And in second place, this one may surprise you, but I have a soft spot for horror. It's got mixed black and white Hellraiser look. This was Fucking incredible. Girl, Hellraiser? I hardly know her. <laughs> I didn't expect to see this type of reference in the finale at all, but the way that Gottmik did it, it's so unique and fresh and like very much is Gottmik. She also took this like all the way. She shaved her head and is, instead of wearing like the nails and the blood, she has crystal spikes as a headpiece. I can't, I cannot get over it. It's so great. And of course, number one, girl, the fact that she did this, <laughs> Gottmik's grand finale look is a moment, it is a serve, it is a cultural reset, and is also, by the way, another Diego Montoya creation. Girl, that fashion studio over there in LA, he makes some beautiful garments. This is immaculately done. Every detail, the structure of how the bottom part of the skirt comes out into that beautiful little trumpet shape with the really ruffles and like the stones and beading going down the side and then the golden skeleton corset thing showing the 
the Swarovski heart on her chest and the wig. Did somebody say wig? Hello, Gottmik said wig. Like, I don't know how Gottmik could ever top this. I don't know how anyone could ever top this. Again, she has set a new standard as she did the entire season on the runway. I'm like, girl, look what you're doing to this show. How is anyone else ever gonna match this stuff? It's, it's too much, it's almost too much, but you know. I don't know, like I might as well just quit drag. Everyone might as well just quit drag after seeing this. That is next level, mama. Honestly, what a finale, what a season. The Gagatrandra of it all. I am so impressed with all these queens, seriously. And the final four, so much charisma, uniqueness, nerve, and talent among all of them. Again, congratulations to Simone. She's gonna be an excellent reigning queen. And as for my hottest hot, well, tonight we have two for the red carpet. It's going to go to Simone. And for the ball, it of course goes to Gottmik. She was number one on the list. I also asked my patrons to vote for their hottest hot. And for the red carpet, they chose Utica. And in the ball, they chose Gottmik's finale eleganza. Click the link in the description to join my Patreon. I'll see you there. Thanks. See y'all next time. Love ya. Bye.